Number 10, spitting. Two words, chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching Western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like brownie green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cups of doors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually, because no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti-spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my god, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France. Worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up, perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. Ha <laughs> ha though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably, I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist, and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together, we still do it in like water parks, we swim in pools of pee pee, and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, it's so great, you're like, why'd you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so. Boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> 
Considering what we know now, that's rough. Number five, the great stink. Um, the what, what? Oh, no, 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 yeah, I read that right. The Great Stink of 1858 was an event in central London in the summer, during which the hot weather exaggerated and amplified the smell of untreated human waste and gunk that had washed up on both in and on the banks of the River Thames. The problem had been growing for years with an out-of-date technology and overflowing sewage system that emptied directly into the river. The stank was thought to have been the root cause of a number of contagious diseases and three outbreaks of cholera before it was agreed upon that a small problem was emerging. You think? Long story short, all the garbage, human waste, bloated bodies were all just washing up around the same time. Hey, I caught one. No, oh, that's an arm. Okay. And just cooking in all that sun all day? I know what August feels like, and I've smelt my garage and garbage day, and I can't imagine the smell already in central London at that time. And for people to have complained so much that it was even stinkier, that's absolutely rotten. Number four, nose gaze. I was just thinking, where are all these inventions and blueprints on how to stop the smell? If you can knit metal into a crop top, you can cover your mouth and nose, can't you? Well, close enough. Nose gays were invented. Basically just big nose plugs one would wear day to day to drown out the smell of absolute filth. Just plug it up and ignore it was their mentality. A makeshift wad of bunched up herbs and flowers shoved up your nose, blocking the nasal cavity from the stank that followed. Just see number five. A poo pourri for each nostril. Would this make things worse, ignoring the smell? Wouldn't that make it even harder to find out where it's coming from? Nope, just band-aid it gonna disappear on its own. We're humans, we're designed to smell stuff for our own survival. The smell is like what lets us know not to go down there. Oh, no, no. Like wouldn't everything just smell like roses at that point? These people were trying to avoid the stinky streets because that actually meant that's where the infection and disease was actually hanging out. The blind leading the blind. Number three, flushing. Okay, we're making some ground here. We got toilet paper, we got something for the smell. So now where do we put it? Well, plumbing and flushing wasn't connected to each house like it is today. See, the Greeks and Romans had it down to a science. They built drainage systems and learned from the ancient Mesopotamian people how to exactly deal with the problem of waste. A system of pipes, tubes, and drains. The bathroom problem seemed like an easy solution. Use gravity downhill to dispose of the waste outside the city. And here's the kicker. It can even be reused and repurposed at the end as an irrigation system, further nurturing the farming of crops. No, that's good. No, he's right. And then it disappears and literally goes downhill again. After the Roman Empire had fallen, this European dark sanitation era had begun and hygiene sort of just slipped away. People weren't really concerned with things like disease and plague and instead leaned into real science like witchcraft or burning cats for fun. You know, important stuff. It wasn't until about the mid 1850s where people revisited this age old problem and recreated and did exactly the same thing science we already knew. Things were unnecessarily stinky for way too long. It wasn't until the British colony started tinkering in Boston around the 1700s that proper piping and toiletry transport was eventually built and catalogued. Thus was born the first sanitation system, again. And we still see it today, thank God. Number two, disinfectants. How did people exactly know if something was clean or not? They couldn't have just seen the particles back then. Let's hear a chamber pot. <sighs> smells clean. People were plugging their noses so they couldn't even smell anything. They couldn't smell if it was clean or not. There certainly wasn't a demand for a fresh lemon scent that we're all used to. This was the birth of some basic antiseptic. Chemists were mixing and mashing chemicals and a new form of cleaning agent was introduced in the 1890s by German chemist science Gustav Ruppenstrock in hopes to rid the country of the overflowing cholera epidemic and seize the spread of germs and the disease. By mixing benzalkonium and hydrogen peroxide, you were left with a chemical compound that would destroy and clean infections on medical patients. Light bulb. Thus leaning towards the direction of an all-purpose surface cleaner, killing bacteria and ridding the area of harmful toxins. And drum roll please, Lysol was created. That's right, the same Lysol we use today. This was a push in the right way for humanity. An easy to use liquid cleaner that would aid disinfecting everything in its way. I've seen the bottle and the Wemyss labels. Must have been even stronger back then too. Hope no one spilled it on themselves in testing. Ooh, ouch, that is a class one chemical burn. <laughs> You're just gonna wanna pee on that for 12 to 13 days. And number one, soap. Finally, the end of all our ailments. Soap, the answer. 
Well, not really. See, it's been around since the Romans, because they literally did everything before us and stop bragging, we get it. Made out of animal fats, ash, and mostly lye, these makeshift balls of soap were invented years ago. And then forgotten, and then invented again, and then forgotten again. Cleanliness was loose, remember, and it was almost uncool to believe in science, and it wasn't really until the mass production of this chemical detergent that it really stuck. Soap was predominantly sold, produced, and commercialized in the late 1800s. By this time, scientists were fiddling around with things like Lysol and more chemical compounds, sparking its way to the study of germs. A vital step towards large-scale soap production, and it actually started in 1791 when a French chemist, Nicolas Leblanc, patented a system for making soda ash from salt, at which point added with animal fat, and there you have it. The slippery bar we're all used to today. The discovery made soap making one of America's fastest growing industries in 1850, and it seemed from then on in it was only up. It's crazy to think that someone at this time, even after soap was invented, were still spit shining surgical instruments to be clean. That's good. Well, there you have it, folks. I'm absolutely disgusted and yet carry a now cleaner representation of who we are and what we've done. From stink houses to spas, hygiene has come a long way. <laughs> or maybe not. Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course. That was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Whoo, here we go. Nowadays, you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal, Seashells. And when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and, you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells. Can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clam shells were used later in the 19th century, and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually, they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still, it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember, when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. 
Today we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay! In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, they would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no! Like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw! Okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse. Back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm gonna stick to the spearmint. Sp spearmint. Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, fake beards. I can't grow a beard, so maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one. You know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this bearded pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with uh, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so again, creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya. Now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, oh, you have acne? Hmm, are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that, come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne, maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like the pyramids? I couldn't tell you. Could you? Didn't think so. Hit that thumbs up. We're both wrong. We're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating. Imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her person. While this of course is a wonderful cosmetic replacement and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, had significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further. And they did. So they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe. And in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals and walking in them would have been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it's clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little 
little more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list, I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful, why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? This is permanent. While on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful. Ancient Egyptians use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their hair and fingernails in shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna, kind of nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you want to get henna. It's important to know, that guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the Old Spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of a deodorant, like underarm deodorant. It was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts, mix them all together and bam, there you go. You're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in in your underarm right there, right there in your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever had that happen? Turns to feta cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. It smells great, but not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. Who knows? Kicking off the list at number 10. Wiper, no wiping. On part three of the series, we of course brought up the worst job in royal history, the groom of the stool. Wiping was a royalty. We didn't have the fluffy bear family telling us to hashtag enjoy the go, where they use an incredible amount, just a wasteful amount of toilet paper. Those bears, so wasteful. We had to improvise back then and use leaves. And by we, I mean medieval peasants, not us. We discussed Romans just pooping through cold cement benches, but what did they use to wipe after the fact? Well, that was the sponge on the stick method, which I'll be honest, that's my favorite of the ancient methods. Because you know somebody had the perfect stick, right? Like one that was like, hm, hm, just the perfect angle to really get in there. No, the sponge on the stick wasn't that fun at all. It was actually communal, it was all bad. You had to share it, be like, oh, okay. Here you go, sir. Early Americans used brick-lined pits, and that was their washrooms. This was around the time of the Declaration of Independence, and besides human waste, people would dump anything in these toilets. They found a window in one of these pits. A window. Some poor guy at a window. Can you believe that? And as for wiping, are you ready? Dried corn on the cob, that's what they would use. Yeah, man, next time you do that corn on the cob butter trick where you like spin it through the butter, all nice and smooth, keep that in mind. Number nine, just pull it. We've talked about brushing your teeth with urine, we've talked about using horsehair for dental floss, but can it get even more bizarre when it comes to oral cleanliness? Yes. We still do this method today. If a tooth is beyond repair or it's causing an infection in your jaw, yeah, just pull that sucker out. See ya. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes. Back in the day though, this was the best and only method. Sore tooth, maybe a cavity, something's not feeling right, maybe your gums are just hurting, maybe you bit down on a bone, no problem. Pull it, no matter what the case is, just <laughs> yank it out. Dentists weren't a thing in the Middle Ages. Dr. Downer didn't politely remind you to floss more, you know what I'm saying? But they did have a barber, the fastest dentist in the game. Barbers are responsible for obviously cutting hair, but they too would pull teeth and they would bloodlet. This guy must have been in the weeds every single day. He was so busy. Yeah, just a little off the top, maybe a little bit of blood at this, a couple of molars too, classic three in one appointment, you're good, debit. If you walked into the barber shop and you were bald, he already knew what was up. He was like, all right, I'm gonna start warming up the arm here. And if you think that's weird, well, let's go a little bit more recent for this one. Number eight, doormat toothpaste. We've mentioned some horrible lipsticks and face powders, so we need to mention this disaster of a brand. Moving past the days where your barber pulls out the problem in the 1940s, we had toothpaste. Yes, we had it, this is good. In fact, we had the most powerful toothpaste ever to this day. It was called Doramad. Okay, yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says, radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Okay. These cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is hindered in their destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mild, refreshing taste. Ah, yummy. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this existed once, not too long ago, is just wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. What would their slogan be today? Doramad, accelerate your breath. Number seven, 
Shards and Shards. Oh, you thought we were done with the Bum Bum history. I think again. This is a part four, and honestly, I could do four more parts on wiping alone. It's a pretty big deal, it's nuts. We don't realize how lucky we are. During the pandemic, for example, one of the first things people stocked up on was toilet paper. It's worrisome to not have six rolls on standby. You start getting anxious, right? You're like, oh, but what if I eat some lobster? I don't know, whatever makes your tummy upset. Now you know a little bit more about me. But nobody did it like the ancient Greeks, and I mean nobody. Survey says ancient Greeks would wipe using broken pieces of ceramic. Oh my god. They would even sometimes write the names of their enemas, I mean enemies, on this piece of shard and then wipe. Isn't that wild? It's like, ah, I'll show you by wiping with ceramic with your name on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, this obviously led to major health problems and according to the British medical journals, three pieces was often enough. Three is still a good number today. That's a comfortable fold, but ceramic, no, there's no way. No way. It was the better alternative, believe it or not. The other was actually sharp seashells. Number six, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was even born, what did people do to smell good? What? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. Nothing like speed stick at all, not even close to being discreet. You can't put the stuff on the bus. Since no, they're gonna, what's that guy doing with that jar of goop? Ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs when it came to ancient deodorant. They made perfumes and were amongst the first to try any type of deodorant. So thank you. Thank you. Hence the ostrich egg factor. Mixing a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shells, nuts, and then bam, you're ready for the day. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. Egyptians would also use porridge balls. Flavored porridge rolled up and then safely secured in your little apple pitter fritters right there. Just don't wave at anybody or else you'll, mm, there you go. Number five, cancer treatment. All right, the big C. Cancer is something that obviously very is you know very prevalent in our modern society. And because of the rising rates, it makes us ask ourselves, did cancer exist in ancient times? If so, where was it recorded? While they didn't call it cancer, it definitely did. Some of the earliest evidence of cancer is found in ancient manuscripts. Mummies, fossilized bone tumors that have been found in ancient Egypt specifically. There are tons of examples and different forms of cancer that have been found throughout. Perhaps the oldest comes from 3000 BC. And it was found, like I said, in the Edwin Smith Papyrus that we talked about before. Now in this text, it describes eight cases of tumors or ulcers of the breast and how they treated them back then, or at least tried to. See, back then these tumors were removed by cauterization using a tool called a fire drill. Other than this though, the text says in reference to the illness that there is no treatment. So in ancient times and today, we're still trying to figure this one out. Number four, tooth extraction. You may not think of surgery when you talk about tooth extraction, but this for sure counts as surgery. This, yeah, I've had a tooth pulled. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. Every time something gets removed from your body, I'm gonna count that. And if there's definitely blood involved, yeah, I'm gonna count that. Getting a tooth pulled is still so barbaric. Even today, they don't like slice a line and then gently slide the tooth out or anything surgical. No, they just have two dentists grab your tooth at the same time, put their foot up, and then yank it out. I was numb, sure, but it was still weird, okay? Back in the day, pulling teeth was done not to make room for braces, but to solve any problem, or well, all problems, regarding your teeth. Yeah, cavity, gone. Toothache, bleh, see ya. Oh, some plaque, no problem. <laughs> Today, we're lucky to have x-rays and modern technology, you know, to tell us if a, a tooth is coming in sideways or which ways. But back then, some believed that it was tooth worms. Yeah, this feeling over here could be a worm. Go get it checked out. Could have worms in your head. Gross. Aristotle and Hippocrates wrote about dentistry around 500 BC, and the way they would handle tooth decay or extraction was by using metal wires to fix wobbly teeth or even a broken jaw aka ancient braces. Number three, trepanation. One of history's oldest surgeries. Trepanation was also, it was, it was the worst, it was horrible. To this day, we're not even sure why this was a thing, but we picked up a few ideas along the way. Let's talk about it. Turning the clocks back to thousands of years ago, trepanation was a practice of drilling holes into your skull. A popular theory is that trepanation was done to release evil spirits. Yeah, let's drill some holes in our skull and see if our mental illness just goes away. That'll help. As barbaric as this sounds, skulls found in Peru hint that this procedure wasn't as fatal as you'd first guess. The reason this would happen was also to clear out bone fragments after skull fractures, right? So you show up with a headache and leave with a, a hole in said head. But honestly, the fact that you're leaving at all is surprising, given the time. They didn't have any advanced medical instruments, but they did have sharp ones. This was the first surgical procedure, it was around 6,500 BC. The term trepanation comes from the Greek term trepanon, borer. 
to, you know, to drill. Number two, rotting whale body. Okay, not all these are not disgusting. One of the most strange things on display at the Australian National Maritime Museum exhibit has got to be the whale carcass treatment. This is an odd treatment. Now the cure for rheumatism back in the 19th century was to crawl inside of a dead whale's body and uh, yeah, just hang out for a bit. And by a bit, I mean a full 30 hours. After that point, you would definitely be healed for at least 12 months. Yeah, it began in the town of Eden, obviously a whaling town on the southern coast of Australia. Only while this was happening, it was kind of funny, the user's head would be poking out of the whale. Yeah, like the world's worst sleeping bag, all tucked in there, getting better. It all started when an intoxicated man stumbled into a dead whale body, passed out, and then when he woke up, his rheumatism was cured, just like that. Yeah, from pale ales to pale whales. No more achy joints for you, my friend, let's do it. And finally, number one. Egyptian nose job. Plastic surgery is more widespread now than it ever has been before, but it's all because it started a long time ago, especially in the ages of the ancient Egyptians. In the Edwin Smith papyrus, along with the documentation of trauma surgeries, bone fractures, fixes, and all that jazz, this text also shows examples of fixes for nasal injuries, which I gotta kinda seek. I have to seek some of that right now. I think I need to get my nose fixed. Can't breathe a lot. The treatment involved manipulating the nose into the desired position before using wooden splints or lint or swabs, anything really to hold it into place. You know, it's an ancient nose job. It's crazy, right? It's truly wild to think back about how much, you know, these people had shaped our world and lives, especially our medical world today. While so much of the civilization still remains a mystery to us, right? It's crazy how much we still know and how much we still don't know. And coming in at number 10, baths. From bath bombs to jacuzzis, when did people exactly start warming up that cold river water to sit in for some R&R? &R? Well, apparently the Romans were the first to think about warming her up. I don't really know if they had it in mind that warm water works better and faster to clean and rid of microparticles and had more of a oh, mentality, but one way or another they did it. Were they really ahead of their time though? The first bathhouses have been discovered in Rome approximately being built somewhere in the second century BC. The first of its kind from a river of cold water to the abundance of over 500 steaming prominent bathhouses. You could pamper yourself head to toe for a small price, small enough so that even the poorest could bathe. That's a lot of small business owners. Hottest water in town, step right up, step right up. The Romans came up with an idea to build a spa house thing which could be flooded and heated by the floor beneath it. With a giant fireplace inside the spa, it was lit by hand and blown through the vents under the floor. Damn, they were smart, huh? Hot and steamy and good for the body. And clean. Well, cleaner. The bathhouse was a technology of its own and it seemed like humanity was headed in the right direction. No, no they were not. Number nine, wiping. Do as the Romans did. It's thought that these people thought of literally everything before us. Oh yeah? How about pogo sticks, think of that? Huh? pogo -onitis? No, no you didn't. Look that up, did they? Over the years I've had some pretty jobs, but nothing as as this one. Literally. Uh, sire, would you like fronteth to backeth or backeth to fronteth today, sire? That's right, there was a job for that. People had to have had started wiping at some point, right? But who exactly and when? The groom of the stool, chief gentlewoman of the privy chamber. Call it whatever you like, we know what they did. So what exactly did they wipe with? Well, usually hay, sticks, fur, or even seashells. Every single one of those sounds itchy and terrible. I know what Charmin can do sometimes, and I can't imagine what a piece of oak could have done back then. Was there splinter taker routers as well? I can't help but feel although how painful and stinky it was, I'm sure there was at least one shared laugh, a little quality time spent with some royalty to say the least. Although this career is speculated, both King Charles I and King James I had them, so unless they decided they wanted to do that after them, someone must have continued doing it. I hope for a pretty penny at least, those waste management dudes have pretty good benefits. Filing your taxes, looking for a job description. Uh, ah, yes, here it is, wiper. Number eight, urine. Okay, is this just gonna be disgusting the entire time? Well, the answer is yes. History's pretty disgusting. Okay, this one is weird because right when we think we figured it all out, something jarring happens, like a jar of piss and all the health benefits it had throughout history. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Well, at least they thought it did. In ancient Rome, not only was this liquid gold sold for, well, gold, it was often traded as a prominent good, sold for its multitude of healing purposes. You see, people have been using urine for thousands of years. That's right, this destructive, toxic bodily fluid could be repurposed, salvaged into many different topicals and treatments. From hair loss to your daily skincare routine, it was not only great for staining and softening leather made for shoes and clothes, it was a natural teeth whitener. 
and antiseptic. <laughs> That's right, from ancient Rome to as late as the 20th century, people have been tinkering and tailoring with their pee. Egyptians did it, Greeks did it, urine is the body's natural antiseptic and was soon turning septic. Like the science behind this alone is what your buddy tells you, you know what I mean? Oh, rolled ankle? Yeah, yeah, just piss on it. Got ghosts? Ah, eh, just pee on it. The ailment for all your needs. Disgusting. Number seven, teeth. Invented in 1488 by Sir Robert Tooth. Okay, I'm joking, no. Teeth were never officially invented, but what we did for them and how we cared for them had people scratching their heads for the last millennia. We've all had a toothache at some point in our lives, so they must have had them back then. In fact, oral hygiene was utterly disgusting. I didn't brush my teeth after my coffee and I can already feel it. Ew. People's teeth were so bad throughout history that dentists were actually training and teaching each other what to do about the huge toothworm problem. That's right. Imagine worms growing inside your teeth. Well, due to the swelling and pressure, people thought there were actual bugs or evil spirits living within their sore tooth, serving them extreme pain. Nope, just an infection. You need a root canal. Oh, and actual worms and bugs living in the tooth. Uh, yeah, you see this gray area right here? Uh, that's a ladybug, right? It's medieval England and things were pretty medieval. Right down to the surgery and if you had an impacted wisdom tooth, well, that wasn't covered. England, 400 AD. People started this new trend of oral hygiene cleaning but it wasn't spin brushes and floss, no, more like mint and vinegar and prayer. Just kind of swoosh it all around in your mouth and wipe your teeth with your shirt and call it another year. If you were lucky enough to rinse your mouth out at the time, then you could have saved yourself a visit to the medieval dentist chair. Well, actually just a slab of rock you sit up against and have a friend who's good at ripping. And there you go, buddy. Hey, wake up. The infection alone from the dirty tools going into your mouth is making me itchy. I feel like my breath stinks more now after I've read this topic. Anybody have any gum? Number six, toilet paper. Finally, something we recognize. Invented originally in China in 851 from the Tang Dynasty, these soft fabric sheets were designed for, well, you know what it was designed for, but yes, mostly the emperor's bathroom breaks and soon caught on for the commonwealth as well. The higher the class, the softer and more luxurious the material. From leather to silk, butts were seeing a kinder, gentler side of hygiene. Two ply bark versus four ply silk. The use of toilet paper throughout Europe is a messy one. Again, wipers and hay and stuff like that. It wasn't until the toilet paper rule created by Joseph Gaiety in 1857 that this hygiene method would solidify and stay for keeps. The classic under versus over is the tale as old as time. You ever want to get into a quick argument at someone's house? Just peek in the loo, see if they're rocking beard or mullet. It's the simplest way to have a know-it-all show you the patent and tell you how to wipe your own ass. Charmin. Number five, the human fly trap. This is honestly so five head. A brilliant play. Might be one of the best moves I've ever seen. Have you ever been to a picnic with a nice sandwich, some fresh crisp potato chips, and an ice cold lemonade as you sit on a warm blanket, enjoying the view just over yonder? When all of a sudden you are attacked by a swarm of bugs that just ruin the vibes. And now you don't even want the sandwich. Who made this lemonade? It's so bitter. I don't even like chips. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt felt the same way, except they had a great way to deal with it. Simply take a few of my servants and slather them in honey. Place them away from our royal picnic and bada bing, bada boom, you got no more flies bothering you or your sandwich. This honestly sounds completely cruel and at a time when hygiene in general wasn't great, how did they get all that honey off? Sure, a dip in the Nile will get rid of most of it, but you probably just glaze yourself for a crocodile's lunch. Honey will get stuck in places where the sun don't shine. And just like shame, you can never really wash it off. Number four, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over, honey. I burn so easily. I have freckles for two days, then the rest is just red and un just bad, all bad. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? They didn't have Banana Breeze SPF 35. What did they do? Well, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Yeah, buckle up. Their routine was written on a tomb wall and also scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol and that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Just some chick named Jasmine, she was like, don't look at it, just stop. Ancient Greeks used olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, did absolutely next to nothing. You'd be burnt and dehydrated, but you know what? Can line, so. 
Number 3. Red Dead Bandage America 1864 there's a polite disagreement between North and South whether the South should be still using YouTube's least favorite S word as a business practice. The verdict? It wasn't very nice. That aside, the Southern states fought hard for a very stupid reason. Idiots. Such a hard fight in the fact that it was taking a serious toll on everyone. Specifically, the southern economy and civilians who got caught in the raw end of the deal. The war was a huge cost of life and money for both sides, but the south just didn't have the same resources the north did. So, after years of fighting, things weren't looking too good. An example of this was the south washing and reusing bandages as supplies were low and casualties were high. This might be hard to stomach, but that's just what happened. Nurses washed the blood off of blood soaked rags and bandages to reuse simply because there was no supply. I don't have to be a doctor to tell you that reusing bandages in a time before antibiotics is a bad idea. It might be better to just not have a bandage in that case at all, as the chance for infection would significantly increase. Dutch, you got any fresh band aids over there? I scraped my knee fight with Micah. Hurts real bad. Maybe get John to kiss my boo boo better. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks as a gift over the holidays, and let me tell you, Still the best thing you can get. Socks and lip balm, you can do anything you want. Game over. Socks in ancient Greece were not the right and left neon green athletic socks that you have today. No, not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC, made fresh from, you guessed it, animal hairs. Yeah, it was gross. This actually led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then tying them up. Cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins and it was softer, lighter, and all that jazz. And then later on in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Socks were associated with the church, they were considered a symbol of purity. Yeah, you heard it. Socks would go all the way up to your leg, a little different than the New Balance ones we have now that just go up to your ankle that, you know, fall off when you're halfway to work and then make you really upset. I have one right now, I'm gonna go figure it out. Number 1. Heavy Stomach We as humans need food and water to live. Water honestly being number one. I mean, I could eat a little bit more, but water's more important. But it is what it is sometimes. People in the past had no choice but to build water pipes out of lead. Sure, maybe it wasn't common knowledge that the lead was toxic, but a lot of people did know. So that's why all the cities that sparked up during the Industrial Revolution were built with such. Lead as a material did make sense, as it was cheap and easy to use. So that simply outweighed the health risk of lead poisoning. Lead was a common material in other products as well. But when your drinking water is supposed to be fresh, maybe it's time to spend a little more so we don't end up, you know, spending a lot more on healthcare for lead poisoning. After years of being underground, the pipes corrode and leak toxins into the water stream. It's why in older cities, a lot of time and money is spent today replacing old pipe infrastructure. To me, it's a classic case of, eh, let somebody else deal with them, sure it's fine. Well, I'm off to go work in a completely safe asbestos factory, I'm sure there's nothing wrong or bad in there. <laughs> Kicking off our list at number 10, Ancient Egyptian Eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star, they look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So, in order to avoid that mess, Ancient Egyptians first had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. You're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days? Perfect. We'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day in high school, I had to use Dippity Doo Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side. I always got the five out of six hold. That was good. Six was too much. Nobody ever did the full six. That's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling spiking glue and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls? I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Cut to today, we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray. That's awesome. DJ Polly. Psst. No. Number eight, 
coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the dead sea was one of the most popular popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bathtub, I can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party early to go have a bath. Sort of God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold, I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath, do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Was like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know. They would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or brain or anything like that. You don't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone on top of your head. Easy. Back in 2019, experts found archeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. It's like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. Nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five, cesspools. Ooh, gross transition. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where to build certain rooms. Like say over a cesspool, for an example, that might be important. Just plug your nose. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, because you know, you, you poop and then gravity and everything goes down. But you need to make sure that those floors are supportive enough. Because in 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt, but the floor in the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through the floor, with a few of them even drowning in that cesspool. What a horrible way to go. Then again, in 1326 England, Richard the Raker had just sat down for dinner, guy hasn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor broke and he fell through and drowned. I'd say chamber pots were safer, definitely, but when it comes to waste, honestly, just out of sight, out of mind. Just get that away from me. Literally, pun intended. Number four, towels. I'm pretty picky when it comes to towels. I always have to have way too many just ready to go at all times. You know, in case I want a bath, in case I want to have two baths in a row, you never know. Today we have nicer towels at hotels than anything, honestly. We all know somebody with a Bahia Principe resort towel in their closet, and you're like, really? Really, you thief? Okay, I'm telling. Around the 1800s, flour sack towels were the best you'd get. Now around this time, suppliers were packaging flour and other foods in these cotton sacks. This saved big time on barrels and eventually they were cut into tea towels. Now come the Great Depression, resources were of course limited, so these flour sacks were used now for multiple reasons. Clothing, toys, quilts, pillowcases, diapers, and of course, towels. Wouldn't feel too good on your back, not at all. Number three, same clothes, new day. King James, and no, I don't mean LeBron, I mean King James VI of Scotland this time around. We'll talk about him another time. He had a pretty sweet idea when it came to changing clothes. You don't. Simple as that. What a dream, right? The amount of times I change my shirt every day for literally no reason, it's such a waste of time. It's like black, mm, gray, mm, black. Yeah, that's it. It's a waste of time. King James would wear the same clothes for months at a time, even wearing the same hat for 24 hours straight. He was devoted to the hat game. He just slept like, didn't move a muscle. He went as far as not bathing either because he thought that it was bad for his health. 
yeah, things were thought differently back then. As you may have known by now on this channel, James became king when he was just 13 months old and he succeeded Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1603, he took over as ruler for both England, Scotland, and Ireland for 22 years. And he looked the same every day. Gotta, gotta love it. Who's committed? Number two, unwanted hair. Pubic hair is a biological mystery, and yes, even after we hit puberty, we still can't figure it out. What are you? What's going on? So far, we believe this is part of our evolutionary history, and it comes from a time where we needed fur all over our bodies, right? Like animals. We evolved to protect ourselves against the cold, and just in general to keep that area, you know, safe. I don't know why I did that sound, but it's safe. So why is it that ancient Greek statues of women are completely hairless? Well, this was a time where if a woman's area was hair free, for some reason, the Greeks symbolized it as being pure. Okay. So in order to be considered pure, you'd have to use razors and creams, pumice stones, methods that were not as smooth as today. What's even more annoying is that men who would grow their body hair out, that was a sign of maturing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either of these categories. I can't grow anywhere where I want to. It's just bald, I'm just a bar of soap. Yeah, I'm not gonna use a stone to shave either. Thanks, we'll pass, next. And finally, coming in at number one, acne. Ancient Egyptians and Greeks came up with an interesting method of getting rid of those pimples. Now, reminder, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing. You ever click one of those videos and you're watching for like 40 minutes? You're like, I'm gonna be sick, is that yogurt? What is that? Physicians back then discussed these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing these mysterious spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then, so that's pretty horrible, that's gonna be in my head forever. They would refer to severe cases as maggots that lie in bed of roses, AKA your face, that's the bed of roses. If a physician told me I had maggots in my face, I'd faint. Teeth worms and maggots, like just brush your teeth and wash your face and then avoid all that smoke. These disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals, so that's pretty wild. So ancient Greeks and Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds to solve that problem. Or what I just do is I just squeeze really hard, yell one curse word, and then wipe the mirror. That's usually how I do it. Kicking off our list at number 10, dental surgery. Back in the ancient Egyptian world, it's not like you could just take a quick trip to the dentist to get your teeth checked out and cleaned, yada yada, and then you go home, whatever, right? The diet of the average Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, conductive to having an impeccable set of pearly whites. That's mostly due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which, you know, would naturally destroy your chiclets. And through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time that have been discovered. And it's pretty horrifying, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, an ancient abscess. We love those. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found for the fourth dynasty. This mummy in his first molar was a bunch of surgically produced holes that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some, you know, very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were in fact happening all those years ago. And before we head into the rest of this list, we also have to remember that all this was done or most of this was done without anesthetics, right? No one's gonna put you to sleep and then you wake up and you're like, ah, oh, my teeth are gone, what happened? No, you were awake for the whole thing. It sucked. Number nine, Egyptian stitches. Yeah, gotta talk about Egyptians once again. I'm gonna talk about them quite a bit. They're the OGs. Just in general, while surgery did exist during ancient Egyptian times, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because, well, obviously, like I just said, no painkillers, no antibiotics, the list goes on, right? No fun. One thing that's less invasive but still extremely important was seen quite a bit during these times. Use of stitches. Yeah, I've never needed any in my life, thank God, knock on. Knock on wood that I don't need any stitches. Ancient Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own sutures in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers or hair or tendons or wool threads, anything, right? In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus that came from ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described. 48, imagine being one of those 48, that's kind of epic, not gonna lie. Number eight, blood transfusion. Back around 70 AD, the Romans were pretty wild when it came to the Colosseum and the games that would go on inside. There was, uh, yeah, a lot of bloodshed and crowds would rush the arena after the day was done. Not to get autographs, but to hopefully, hopefully get a sip of that sweet gladiator blood. Yeah, blood back then was a magical elixir. And then near the early 1500s, blood was seen as this 
youth juice. Yeah, you drink some young blood as an elderly, and then those knees, your patellas, would apparently start working again. A lot of theories surrounding blood back then. And in the Middle Ages, bloodletting was a go-to when you were sick because they thought your humors were out of balance. It is so hot in this goddamn room. In 1628, blood circulation was discovered by a man named William Harvey. That changed the game, right? Now, the idea of something going into your bloodstream was in the picture hypothetically. That's a little odd. So we started to test this out on canines. Scientists were injecting them with different substances, and slowly but surely, that turned into blood transfusion between animals, between canines. So this is back in the 1660s, right? That's how early we started injecting things with blood. It's kind of gross. Number seven, cataract surgery. Okay, don't tell him I told you this, but Kyle, my brother Kyle, our other lovely co-host on B, is blind in one eye. Yep. Kyle was born with a cataract, but you would never know because he plays rugby amazingly and somehow he reads this tiny prompter. I can barely do it with two eyes. No idea how you do it, man. You're a champ. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgeries in the book. Well, rather, in the painting. It was found in a tomb in ancient Egypt. It was a painting of what is surely the oldest recorded eye surgery. Scientists are able to make this conclusion due to the length of the tool that the doctor is holding. They believed this was a method called couching, which happened to be recorded. See, the needle would push the cloudy lens to the bottom of the eye, ideally fixing their vision. The oldest tools found in Egypt tell us that 4,000 years ago, this was the first time it had been done. But afterwards, evidence of couching was found all over the world. Now, it wasn't until 1747 until Jacques Daniel, a doctor in France, he performed the first ever cataract extraction surgery in a modern sense. He was the OG. Every method sounds wildly uncomfortable. Have you been through this? Like Kyle has kudos. Number six, skin treatment. As soon as summer comes around, honestly, it's game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter, right? I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did ancient Egyptians beat the heat back in ancient times? They didn't have banana breeze SPF 35. No, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. Yeah, you think your morning skin routine requires a lot of work? Buddy, read a book. Their routine was written on a tomb written on tomb walls and scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinal. Yeah, that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Ancient Greeks would use olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You're burnt and dehydrated, but also you look good, okay? Tan lines, I see you. Number five, face care. So we've gathered that folks in the middle ages didn't bathe often, but when they did, it was just the necessities, right? They didn't have time to you know, Old Spice, all their stuff up like they do. Then time to dance in the shower and shower backwards. It wasn't a fun event. Hands and face, that's it. That's all you really need anyways. If you couldn't afford a walk-in shower back in the day, you'd have to invest in an ewer and basin. You would all have to share the same thing and take turns dipping your hands and face in all day long, just the same. Mm -hmm. Protecting your face was vital for ancient Egyptians 6,000 years ago. They would honor the gods with makeup, but at the same time, they would also protect their skin from the sun. We love that. Today we have like SPF creams. I'm like, this is nothing, this is no fun. Ancient Greeks would use oils to clean their face and they would later scrape it off. And in the 1700s, many believed in saunas and sweat cleansing. The number one trick to clear skin, you guessed it, milk baths. Milk is really the name of the game for this part seven, eh, wow. Goat milk mouthwash, milk baths. I'm gonna go milk a cow after this video. Just because, you know, feels right. Number four, python bile. Yeah, I just said python bile. So if you're eating food right now, I'll just I'll, I'll give you a sec, hit that pause button. Not only pythons also, but numerous animals, their bile would be used to treat ailments. Ulcers of the female genital area, yeah, that's what the doc was giving you. Python bile, have fun. Ancient Chinese physicians would also hand over some elephant bile as well if bad breath was bringing down your game. Elephant bile mixed with water would get rid of halitosis. Honestly, any type of bile, just count me out. I just won't brush. How's that? Taylor, why do you have bad breath? Oh, have you seen the alternative? That's why, Mike. That's why. I almost tripped, but that's why. I almost broke my leg. I'm upset about bile. Number three, malaria. Perhaps one of the most bizarre ways to treat one disease definitely is by getting another. If you suffered from syphilis back in the early 1900s, there wasn't really much help you could get. That was until Austrian physician Julius Wagner Joreg came along. He received the Nobel Bell Prize for this discovery, and as bad as it sounds, it's honestly quite the breakthrough. Julius discovered that malaria-induced fevers were the key to treating syphilis. Ye nice. Now we're, I guess, we don't do this anymore because, well, malaria is still horrible and a hefty amount of patients lost their lives trying this method. So no, we at Bumblebee do not recommend this method. We have other ways to treat it now. Number two, 
rabies. It's a part seven. Let's talk about rabies. Might as well. This is a haunting list so far. Pre-rabies vaccine. I mean, what the hell did we do? Before 1885, that's when French scientists Louis Pasteur and Emile Roux, they developed the first rabies vaccine. We were pretty much SOL if a rabid animal were to bite you beforehand. I mean, one of the leading theories to prevent the spread of rabies was to not let your dog outside while there was a full moon. You know, that middle-aged bull where every remedy just sounds like a side quest in Skyrim, that kind of stuff. Oh, you'll need one egg and two pigeons. I'm like, what? I have, a, I have strep. What are you talking about? In 16th century Europe, it was a literal joke if you had rabies. Doctors quite literally told you to ingest 40 grains of ground liverwurst and wash it down with 20 grains of pepper and a half pint of milk. That's it, that's how you cure rabies. That's how you do it, I guess. You gotta ingest that each morning for four days in a row. Oh, and you also need to have a cold bath every day for a month. Imagine if this really was the only solution, even today. Just cuts to us in 2022 with iPads, technological advancements, we're creating new vaccines, but in order to cure rabies, you still need to slam some milk and have a bath. It's like, yeah, that's the only way. That's the only way we've done it so far. Hygiene history is insane. I'm gonna push for a part eight. Hit that thumbs up so I can keep talking about this nonsense. This is insane. I learn something horrible every day here. And finally, number one, electricity. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, has been around a lot longer than most of us think. It just didn't work back then, you know? Also, we don't call it shock therapy anymore. We're well past that. Tiny electric currents would be sent through your brain, ideally changing its chemistry, and over 1,000 people a year undergo this treatment. But back in ancient Roman times, this procedure, of course, was a little sketchy, just a little wee bit. They would use electric eels. Yeah, they would hang out with a bunch of electric eels to hopefully relieve a headache. Again, I'd rather just have a headache. I'm not trying to become a Spider-Man villain, okay? I just, I'm nearsighted. Today we believe the seizure aspect is beneficial, but back then it was believed that electricity was the key here. We would drink electrified water and wonder why nothing's happening. Number 10, the forbidden toothpaste. If I looked into your bathroom right now, what would I see? Oh, uh, you forgot to flush the toilet. If it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Seems you've forgotten your own golden rule there. What I was actually looking at was for a flavor of toothpaste that you had. Classic mint, maybe you got cinnamon. Maybe you go for the whole bamboo toothbrush charcoal toothpaste vibe. Hey, I respect it, good on you for making better choices. But bad on the Aztecs for making gross choices. Ever look at some forbidden lemonade and think, hey, add some salt to this. And now we got ourselves a bona fide toothpaste? Of course you didn't, because you ain't a crazy person. Or at least I hope you're not. But yeah, Aztecs used to brush their teeth with an unholy mixture of golden broth, pee, and salt. Yeah, I. why would you add salt to pee? I, I think it cleans teeth, sure. You just have to borrow an Egyptian breathman after. It's no big deal, it's fine. It's good for your teeth, it's fine. Number nine, high stakes. Any good game of a sport will have you at the edge of your seat and dropping all cheese flavored snacks around you just so you can keep your eyes glued to the screen. The Aztecs did not have access to such finger licking good things like Doritos, but what they did have was a sport that was very high stakes, maybe too high actually, as if you didn't win, it could very well cost you your life. A game called, here we go, Chris is gonna like me pronouncing this, called Omalazitli. With its nine pound rubber ball and eye shaped court, players had to pass the ball through a small stone ring. This game was taken very seriously, like ritual serious, and you didn't want to be on the losing side, as it may cost you your head. Yes, even sports events in modern times have gotten violent, sure. But if we started lopping off heads for our losses, well, Tom Brady would have a lot more blood on his hands, wouldn't he? Number eight, hot chocolate. As a Canadian, I cannot tell you how important the medicinal qualities that are a hot chocolate on a wet, cold winter's day. You've been slipping and sliding down a snow hill for hours, and your snow pants are soaking wet, partially from the snow and also because your dad made you go down the super scary hill and it was too much for you. Don't tell mom. Hot chocolate was important for the Aztecs too, more so just chocolate actually. It was used for a number of things. First off, after the beans have been roasted, they smell amazing, so it most likely went into some perfumes and other lovely smelling things that they used. It was also used as currency, strangely enough, and it was also, 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 used as a ritual drink, except they didn't exactly have sugar, so they used other things, other ingredients like peppers and other unusual flavor enhancers. To, for chocolate, I don't, pepper, I, I never understood that. People are like, it's hot, like Mexican hot chocolate, it's, it's pepper and chocolate. It's a weird, hot, cho hot spicy chocolate. Not a, not a fan, not a fan. Number seven, corn goddess. 
I like corn just as much as the next guy. Roasted, boiled, and on the cob. Slap some salted butter on that bad boy, whew, it's time to dig in. Make sure you got the corn on the cob holders though. The little metal thingies that you'll probably end up stabbing yourself with later, that's just, that's just how it goes. Besides backyard summer barbecues, corn was an important staple of the Aztecs. So important that they had a festival to honor the corn goddess. Which to me is kind of a lame thing to be a god of, but alright, let's run with it. Zilonan Festival had the women let their hair loose and green corn placed in it to honor the god, the corn god. A forced female volunteer was dressed as the goddess and after many days of what I'm assuming is eating and worshipping corn, the forced volunteer was sacrificed by the people to once again honor the corn god. You'd think a bowl of corn would do the job, but no, nope, she's got a lust for blood so that means uh, off with a head. Number 6 End Times We all know what ancient civilizations are like with predicting the future, or more specifically, predicting the end times. Mayans thought everything was going to fade to black in 2012. Didn't did it. Some people really thought this was going to happen. I always thought that Buddy just didn't get around to finishing the thing, but hey, whatever works. Well, if it was real, why didn't the world end? Well, the Aztec answer to that was the new fire ceremony. Another ceremony, why not? Basically, every once in a while, things got a little crazy. It was a time to cleanse, a spring cleaning, if you will. People stopped working, destroyed household items, and at the end of a five day cycle, some priests would take a dude up a volcano and toss him in there like I toss away bad report cards from my mother. All this to prevent the end of the world. Virus, act of God, bad hygiene. Whatever it was, just good old fashioned blanket solution. <laughs> Number five. Dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently. But why are we even doing it? Do we know? Other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth the first apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The Queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she is the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you'd have to go back on it so you'd look hot. I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine. And I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face, and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick, you ask? Radiation. They didn't know this yet. It was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal, heavy thing, just face to face. Now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what? At least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? 
Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows? Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches, the early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, Euphelius? I don't wanna be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. Number 10, wash your hands. No, seriously, go go wash your hands right now. When was the last time you washed those filthy mess? Go wash your hands. Washing your hands is super important, especially these days. But something that's very unusual about the Aztecs compared to a lot of other civilizations in history is that, well, they did wash their hands. Oh, and you have no idea how happy that makes me. No more shall I have to think about people shaking hands after using the bathroom with no toilet paper. That's disgusting. Or scooping food onto a plate with their bare, dirty hands and sharing that food with the rest of their families. Yes, the Aztecs like to wash their hands before and after a meal, which is just the way it should be. I hate having grimy hands. You know, I talked to the chief today, and you know what he said? That's it, that's actually it. Yeah, we like that, that's it. Number nine, Aztec Barbershop. It must have been quite the sight for Spanish conquistadors to land upon the shores of North America and then come to bear witness the Aztec civilization in all its glory. Something noticed by the curious Europeans was that the Aztecs had what looked like a barbershop for men. After all, a healthy scalp is a happy one. Even more interesting than that, however, is women were dyeing their hair with a green herb that I'm not even going to begin to pronounce. It was just too hard. It was a lot of X's and T's. I couldn't do it. Which produced a purple shine to their hair. Some women even shaved their hair off, while older women, like mothers, had longer hair. Man, it's almost as if a beautiful civilization was starting to flourish. Well, I'm sure nothing bad ever happens to the Aztecs, right? Number eight. My heroes. Let me create a scenario for you. I like creating scenarios. Let me create a scenario for you. You're on the way to a certain event that is very important in the big city. Maybe it's a new job, a new summer fling, or something that requires dry pants. But now your stomach is acting up. It's big angy. Your stomach's making sounds that are becoming more audible and you can feel soon you will require a bathroom. But you hold it in. I can make it past this event and then go, you say to yourself, no problem. But now you've got cramps, sweats, and you're getting anxious, as you know that DEF CON 1 is approaching. You now have to make a decision to make a rush to find a bathroom, or be late for your event, or take a gamble with your underwear and dignity. Yes, that is a feeling I know all too well, but perhaps I should have been living in the Aztec Empire, as they had public washrooms all over the city. That's just awesome. Oh, what sweet relief. As if that weren't the most unusual, they also had citizens cleaning the streets, which is pretty unusual for the time. Yes, cleanliness was very important to the Aztecs, and honestly, I think there should be public toilets on every street corner. Please, sometimes I gotta go. Number seven, thirsty. After a trip to the public washrooms, you may need a drink of water to rehydrate yourself. I mean, come on. I know I could use some hydration after that. 
Sometimes it gets really sweaty in there. Well, it's a good thing that the Aztec cities had canals. And not just the kind of canals a small Italian gentleman derives a boat through on Valentine's Day, but canals that handled both transportation and irrigation. Aztecs knew just how important water was for life, but perhaps most unusual about the Aztecs is their night soil collectors, which honestly sounds like it's hiding something just in that name. Night soil. Basically, they were beta garbage collectors who used canoes to transport this night soil to farms for fertilizer. And yes, night soil is exactly what you think it is. Poop! But it's unusual for a civilization to be so conscious of where their waste goes. Don't believe me? Well, how about this summer? We all get together, we all go up to New York City and take a dip in the Hudson River. Yeah, not many takers, didn't think so. They were doing their best with what they had. And if women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. You know what I'm saying? Number six, ye olde dentistry. Look, every time I find a decent dentistry fact, I slap that bad boy in here like a debased infomercial host with a surprisingly effective kitchen gadget. You're gonna love my nuts. Remember that guy? This is just one of those facts. Do I have a fear of the dentist? No. No, I don't, because my dentist is nice and has all the modern amenities to make me feel at ease. A comfy chair, laughing gas, and putting Peppa Pig on the TV because I'm a big baby. Goo goo gaga. However, no amount of any of those things I mentioned can prepare you for the dentistry before the year 1900. It was crude to say the least, but hygiene is hygiene, and you gotta keep that mouth fresh and clean. Tooth infections were fixed with rubbing charcoal in the affected area, and if that wasn't enough, a super safe mixture of snake venom and vinegar was used. What? I, okay. Who was the first guy that discovered snake venom had such healing properties? Probably the same weirdo who first milked a cow, if I had to guess. Aztec dentistry included fillings and tooth removal as well. Also, ladies of the evening dyeing their teeth distinct colors, so then you'd know if you know. You know? Look at my red teeth, boys. Number five, crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again, who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop up there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one is hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting, I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign, but a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? 
<laughs> some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? Well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, On the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are a mass of excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out, bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Number 10, suck on a clove. Bad oral hygiene was not permitted back in ancient China. Bad breath, even less so. For example, if you were going to be seeing the emperor, it was required that you suck on a clove beforehand to make your breath all nice and fresh, just in case. I think I'm going to use that as an insult. I'm not going to say it again because I feel like, no. Yes, I like this. Other than breath fresheners, the ancient Chinese used primitive toothbrushes made of willow branches that were rinsed clean and then chewed to make all hairy and stuff. And then dipped in some of this tooth cleaning powder made of a bunch of different ingredients like pork teeth, saponin, ginger, cooked remina glutinosa, mulu, eclipta, lotus leaf, green salt, and other things I don't want to struggle to pronounce. Okay. Before that though, they would also use salty warm water as a mouthwash, which would make their teeth more firm and help clean them. I actually do this uh, like every once in a while after I brush my teeth too. It's actually really good for your gums. These ancient Chinese knew what was up. Number nine, bathing. 
In ancient China, the etiquette of a gentleman demanded that he wash his hands five times a day, take a bath every fifth day, and wash his hair every third day. Bathing every day was a bit of a superstitious no-no, started by northern Chinese societies that would actively avoid cold water or bathing in the winter to avoid getting a cold altogether. And not bathing at all was considered barbaric, like those pesky Mongols who hated bathing and who were hated by the Chinese. Honestly, that part is, is kind of fair. They, they, they kind of sucked. So yeah, to kind of reach a nice midpoint, the norm was to wash once every five days. But that was for the nobility. The common people had access to giant bathhouses where they would go, and I mean, they could go whenever they wanted, really. I shower every morning. I have heard that's bad, but I don't think I'd willingly go for like five days without washing, so I don't know. Maybe I gotta move it to every other day. I, somebody give me advice, please. Let's move on, I, let's just move on. Number eight, rice water. So, the Chinese washed like once a week. That's fine, but how did they wash? What did they use? Well, in the beginning, it was actually common to bathe using rice water as your go-to. It would be used as both body wash and shampoo. The rice water was really good at removing oil and keeping that hair and scalp nice and beautiful, as well as keeping skin nice and silky smooth. The rice water also contains starch, protein, and vitamins that are really good for us. It helped with lower back pain, frostbite, and it was really good to help relieve some of the exhaustion after a long day. Most baths are good at that, honestly. The Chinese also used honey locust that was really good for eliminating dirt and treating rheumatism and ringworm. Both rice water and honey locusts were used for doing laundry as well, with honey locusts keeping clothes unfaded and in good condition. As far as ancient cultures go, the Chinese are already far ahead and we're only on the eighth point. Number seven, threading. Bet you didn't know that hair was not really people's favorite thing in ancient China. I saw somewhere that they even referred to it as thread-like things of troubles. Why the hate? I don't know, but it was part of the reason monks would completely get rid of it. Other people were to remove their hair too, and one way of doing that was the practice of threading. A form of hair removal that is still a thing we do today, actually. Now, I apologize if I mess this up, I've never had it done, but threading basically consists of a thin cotton or polyester thread that is doubled, then twisted, and then it's rolled over areas of unwanted hair, plucking the hair at the follicle level. In our modern day and age, it's typically used for eyebrows to shape them and keep them gorgeous. In ancient China, they would use threading to deal with facial hair, which, I mean, I guess eyebrows kind of count as facial hair, so. Threading isn't really opportune for arm or leg hair, though, so it's just a pure facial thing. Good to know. Number six, combs. Yeah, some people didn't like hair, but those who deal with it made sure to keep that stuff nice and combed. Combs were all the rage. A province of China even got the nickname of the home of combs, which is a great name. Whether they would be made of wood, stone, or animal bone, many combs were made with care and craftsmanship. Comb shops would open up all over the show and people would carry combs as accessories. They'd come in all sizes. Get yourself a comb for the weekends, a large comb to get all your hair at once, a comb to hold your hair in place. Heck, get a comb to help weed out those pesky lice. Number five. Shampoo. When my hair grew longer over the pandemic, I had a huge wake up call. I had no idea what I was doing. I only used the guy's shampoo, you know, like the classic four in one shampoos that wasn't working anymore. I needed some curl cream. I needed shampoo and conditioner, separate things. It takes time to figure out what works with your flow, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders. They would just dip their hair in cold water at a public bathhouse, also very public, and then rub and scrape oils away. Lime wire was also used to wash your hair back then, but that was horrible. It's just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all. They would just rub their head with bran before bed and then brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. Honestly, guys, I'm not gonna lie. There's something they're not telling us. It was too nice. Number four, aqua tofana. Not to be confused with Aquafina, which is also pretty horrible, Aquatafina was hot in the 17th century. This was a straight up poison that was marketed as a cosmetic. This was during the late 1600s and it was first used by two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofania Di Amato. They used this cosmetic, this makeup, so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. It's named after its creator, a lady named Tefania, who was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through who we believe was her daughter, Yulia Tefana. She took this deadly recipe all the way to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and perhaps belladonna. 
It was colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. This cosmetic took over 600 lives. Brutal. Number three, baldness. So what if you're going bald, but you don't have a massive 16th century stupid wig, then what do you do? Well, back in those days, if your hair started to thin out or you were losing patches, you would need a mix of chicken droppings. Yeah, chicken mixed with potassium. Okay, this ancient advice comes from a man named Peter Levins. He wrote this method down in 1654 as an alternative to lice-infected wigs. Both sound absolutely horrible. Honestly, I think I'd rather the lice-infected wig. At least then you can just take it off. Number two, sailor's delight. Life on the sea was all but a sea breeze. And even today, you know how hard it is to take a on a boat? Whale watching fun and games until your stomach decides it's had enough of the sea and wants to go home. While it's a rockin' and rollin' way of using the loo, how did sailors do it back in the day, before anything helpful? Was it easier being far away from the general public? Was it helpful that water was all around the place? Honestly, not really. That's when a tow rag comes into play. Yeah, anytime the word rag is used, you're not in for a good time. Near the head of the ship where the toilet was, this little indent or whatever the toilet, it wasn't a toilet, it was a hole, there was a single rope with a rag, and when it wasn't being used, or shared rather, the rag would be tossed over the side of the ship so it would just dangle in the water and wash away all day, which is fine, I think? I'm not really sure. The sharing is caring thing, I'm not on board for, pun intended. Do you fold, do you scrunch, or do you use barnacle rope? How do you do it, guys? Comment down below. Number one, Q-tips. I love Q-tips a lot. I do two at the same time, and then I flip them, and then I do it again. Yeah, I get them twice. The first one for cleanliness, and the second one because it's for me, because I feel like it. Sue me. My eyes roll right back. It's the best. If COVID tests were done through your ear, I'd be getting tested twice a day just for fun. Q-tips, most of us know by now, weren't exactly made for cleaning your ears. As much as we only use them for that, Q-tips were invented in 1923 by a man named Leo Gergenzang after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Sounds a lot like she invented Q-tips, but sure, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. Baby Ray's is like, mm, too close. Sweet Baby Ray's is like, way too close. Our, our sauce is not even close to that product. Back in those days, Q-tips were actually dipped in boric acid first before being shipped out. They were intended to sterilize wounds. After this, there was even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams, Q-cards, whatever, you name it. Anything that made you a QT. Mm. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be used in your ears? Like, sorry, what? What's that all about? Is that real? Well, in 2008, autologist Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax further into your ear canal, leading to possible infections. When Chesbro Ponds bought the company in 1962, they added the warning on the box. A warning we all gladly will still ignore, like I said at the beginning. Mm. I take one look at my earbuds and I'm like, yeah, I need four Q-tips right away. I need Q-tips yesterday. What's up? Kicking off the list at number 10, Hot Topics. Over in Finland, they're changing the game. The sauna over there is considered a national institution. It's a large part of both Finnish and Estonian cultures. These saunas are commonly found surrounding Finland's lakes, corporate headquarters, and, oh yeah, of course, the parliament house. Saturday in Finland is traditional sauna day. It's not Saturday for the boys, it's just Saturday and we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in each other's mouths for a bit. I can't even fit into a bathtub. I look like an octopus trying to escape a jar. It's not relaxing, it's not a good Saturday at all. I wanna move to Finland. When government leaders can't agree on an issue, they take it to the sauna. How amazing does that sound? In the middle of passing a bill, dudes will just pause and then go hit the sauna. We need this over here. Finns describe the sauna as a secret weapon behind their diplomatic advances. Director of the Finnish Employers Confederation described the ritual saying that it's easier to discuss problems openly. It's like when we're doing a presentation in class, they always say to imagine everybody naked. Well, this was just that scenario played out in real life. Take away the briefcase and tie, you're just a naked dude sitting on a bench talking about inflation. Kind of an odd picture when you think of it. Number nine, the outhouse. One thing I am glad I don't have to deal with anymore is outhouses. Not that I ever did, it's just something I don't want to do. I called the chief again last night and uh, he said it wasn't it, again. Outhouses have been around for a long time. Technically just a hole in the ground where the business is done. It wasn't until later a small wood shack was built around said hole. And then it became an outhouse. Because the design of the outhouse is quite simple, there is a few design flaws that really just don't make any sense. Okay, yeah, it had to be built away from the house as it is a pit full of refuse that exit a human being. But it's also built away from your house. So if you gotta go bad, I mean, you gotta go bad. You might not make it. This also is not so fun if you live in a place where it's cold. 
and you have to dress just to take a leak. But really what is the craziest thing is that after a certain time, that hole is going to fill up with an unholy godliness I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And now you gotta move it somewhere else. I know they wouldn't fill up that fast, but after a few years living in the same place, there'd be a few holes everywhere and that's, that's just not good decoration, is it? Not to mention if you were living in the time of the expanding west, an unseen rattlesnake or scorpion could make the potty time your last. I'll just stay indoors, thanks. Number eight, there's not a visine for that. Does anybody else sneeze when they look at the sun or is that just me? Do I have issues? I have a handful of allergies and one of them apparently is a star, that's neat. My eyes are literally always dry. I think I forget to blink. I'm not really sure what's going on, but today there's a visee luckily for everything. Eye drops are common, but written in the oldest book of medicine, the Evers Papyrus, chock full of ancient Egyptian medical recipes, it contained old optical treatment. Even in Egyptian artwork, you can find ancient cataract treatments. British archeologist Austin Henry Layard found these clay tablets from ancient Babylonia around 625 BC, and treatment for dry eyes was a little different than today. Today, all you have to do is and you're good. Back then, you had to get chemicals from plants and then mix them with prayers. Good game, good luck. One ancient tablet described the treatment of the time saying, if a man's eyes are affected with dryness, he shall rub an onion and then drink a beer and then apply oil to his eyes. Just mix all that sh put it in your mouth, and then thou shalt disembowel a yellow frog mix in its gall and curd and apply it to its eyes. I don't even know what the f that means. Like imagine getting that on a prescription, you're like a yellow frog, what? Number seven. One night with Venus, two years with Mercury. It wasn't too long after humans discovered toe curling that as much fun as that may be, there can be some unfortunate side effects. Knowing somebody in the biblical sense can transmit not so fun diseases if you catch my drift. Like syphilis, early stages being sores and uncomfortable rashes, late stages having much more serious side effects, like blindness, heart disease, and oh yeah, it can make you go crazy. So throughout history, and especially before there was antibiotics, how do you treat a disease so common amongst people participating in the devil's dance? Liquid mercury, yep. People try to treat a disease by consuming liquid mercury. When applied to the skin, it burned. Therefore, if it hurts, it works. It was noted that syphilis would go away after mercury treatments, but this could have just been a stage of the bedroom rodeo disease as its symptoms disappear right before things get bad. This is also assuming that people taking mercury aren't getting sick of mercury poisoning in the first place. This practice continued way longer than it should have as it wasn't until discoveries made in the 1900s that a better option for treating the brothel related illness. Honestly, with this kind of logic, anything's possible. Sky's the limit when you're crazy. Number six, the great stink of 1858. It's one thing living through a pandemic, but at least we're not living through something called the Great Stink. Yeah, the Great Stink of 1858. Who was responsible for this? What did you eat? What happened? Well, this was an event in central London and it lasted for a few months in the summertime too, which is just great for great stinks. It was so hot and dry that the Thames dried up, leaving just sewage, just all that gross you can imagine. The smell was so bad, Parliament had to close for an entire day. I wanna know who the first guy was to be like, you know what, nah, I'm going home. This sucks, this sucks. Good call. In order to continue work, Parliament had to soak the curtains on the riverside of the building in lime chloride just so they wouldn't be sick. They just soak it in chloride to be like, that's better, it's better, we think. They were on the verge of moving their entire operation to Oxford, that's how bad it was. Members of the committee were quitting their jobs. While this sounds all bad, hundreds of tons of limes were being discharged into sewers to help the smell. So if you had a stuffy nose in July 1858, you could have made 1,500 pounds a week just messing around with limes. You missed your shot. Number five. Well, I didn't have any corn. Austin Powers reference for you. You know the character I'm talking about, I can't say it. Here's a hygiene product that just makes me question life. The very fabric of our existence. Whether it was the Big Bang or the Almighty Creator, there's just no way this was ever meant to happen. I just, it doesn't make any sense. One day, somebody was walking along the Nile River and was unfortunate enough to step in crocodile droppings. Now, most people would say, gross, and move on. Oh, no, not the people of ancient Egypt. They felt the stinky, squishy unholiness on their feet and said, yes, we must bathe in this. <laughs> and they did. They took the forbidden mud bath, the brown tsunami, the cesspit of no hope. You can call it whatever you want, really. It's, it's horrible either way you look at it. Supposedly, it was meant to keep you young and beautiful. My only question would be, at what point did they realize poo baths were a mistake? 
Was it when they were smelling it and it was bad? Or was it when it accidentally got in your mouth or something like that? And you're just like, oh, what? It, it what got that out of my mouth? That's the Scottish Egyptian, in case you were wondering. Number four, waste removal. This one is kind of a broad stroke, but hear me out. There's no plumbing, no waste removal, and people kind of just go wherever they want. A lot of that unhygienic waste is kind of just laying about. However, the people of Egypt also had the advantage of the Nile River, which means they used that bad boy for everything. Transport, irrigation, a water source, and of course, a bathroom. Which in case you didn't know, your source of water and irrigation should be two separate, that, that shouldn't be, they shouldn't go together, that's not good. This is a good explanation for the plagues of Egypt, besides the sin, bad sinners, no sinning. As years of that kind of negligent waste management are liable to make any pharaoh sick. Don't mix your water with the poo, don't do that, that's bad, don't do that. Number three, sunscreen. This should come as no secret to anyone out there, but with my rosy cheeks and fair complexion, I would not do very well in the suns of ancient Egypt. Honestly, I don't know how Luke Skywalker lived on Tatooine with those twin sons. Without a little copper tone action, you know what I'm saying? The Egyptians had an answer to that problem, however. Not the whole living on Tatooine part, that, that just kind of sucks no matter what. Blue milk is weird. They had a makeshift sunscreen using rice bran extracts and a few other ingredients that were meant to help protect against the sun's rays. How effective was it really? Not sure, because the only stuff I'm willing to test out is the real stuff. And if I get burnt, then I start peeling. And then somebody has to rub aloe vera all over me. Be right back, I'm gonna get some sun. Number two, cursed craft dinner. You've got no plumbing in your palace, and it's time for dinner. So how does an Egyptian royal make his favorite pot of KD without water? I mean, if college kids can do it in their dorm room, surely they can master the art of post-secondary cuisine. Well, for some unlucky folks, it means taking a pot and walking down to that old Nile River almost like people rely on water or something, and take a big scoop of water and bring it back. But while you begin to scoop some water, you may notice someone is picking up crocodile dung, and people are bathing in the water. And, and to your left, there's a maiden washing clothes, and to your right, there's a man doing something I can't repeat on YouTube. Oh well, time to scoop some more water up and consume this clean, nice water at home. Oh, this is the best. Tastes like the village. It's nice. Number one, pink milkshake. Does it still count as hygiene if you ain't breathing? I say yes. Besides the pyramids and maybe the Nile, mummies are the most famous things about Egypt. And in a weird way, it is hygiene. Hygiene for the afterlife. When someone super important passes on, it's time for a little game of operation. Stomach, liver, intestines are removed and put into jars. You never know when you might need that next. The heart is left because it's the heart and the Egyptians were diehard poets, so you gotta souls in there, you gotta keep that. The most grim process to me, however, is turning the human brain into a forbidden milkshake by mashing it with a small spike and then draining it out in what must have been the grossest waterfall ever. Oh God, that just, oh God, that's so gross. <laughs> anyway, then you take some linen and start wrapping the mummy up like a dad wrapping last minute gifts on Christmas Eve. Bada bing, bada boom, there you go. Buddy is prepped for the afterlife. Uh, don't mind me, I'm just gonna be sick from the brain milkshake, ooh. Kicking off the list at number 10, pig toilets. Yeah, we'll start off with a nasty one. Look, we're on the part six now, we're talking about some ancient hygiene practices. It's gonna get gross, it just has to at this point. I've talked about Roman toilets, horsehair dental floss, so now we gotta dive into some yucky stuff. Pig toilets began around 200 BC in China, and these pig toilets were actually pretty common. You would just go to the washroom over top of a pig pen. It's pretty straightforward, it's pretty awful, but also it's all they had. It was pretty awful, but I would say it's worse for the pigs, definitely worse for the pigs. The pigs would eat the waste because it was mixed into their food, they couldn't tell the difference. Ugh, horrible. This was one of the few options to manage waste, especially in areas where plumbing wasn't possible. I talked about pigs going to court in your recent Bumblebee video. If I was a pig, I would be pressing charges left, right, and center after this. That's so disgusting. We're at number 10 and I want to puke. Nice, buckle up. Number nine, water closets. This one sounds fun, a closet full of water. What a blast, pun intended. Back in the 1800s, all over Europe, our modern day version of the bathroom came to life. Thankfully, I'm very glad this happened. If it didn't happen, it'd be, it'd be a little bit different nowadays. It takes two things to have a water closet, a home big enough for a room purely devoted to waste, which is amazing, and of course, running water, that definitely helps. Sir John Harrington, godson to Queen Elizabeth I, was determined to invent what we now know as the basic toilet. Back in 1596, he created this idea, and people actually made fun of this guy for spending so much time working on a useless device. Yeah, 
the more we know. Cut to 200 years later, another inventor by the name of Alexander Cummings reworked the water closet, added an S trap, a little valve between the top and the bottom parts of the bowl, and now we're on the right track. Then a couple years later, in 1777, Samuel Prosser applied for a plunger closet patent and got it. A year later after that, Joseph Brama enters the toilet game, adds a valve on the bottom, an old school ball cock. So we're getting there, slowly over time. Different inventors are bringing their new ideas in, all so that we can go and take a sh Brahman was a sailor at the time, so his water closet was often used on ships of that era. Today we have toilets that flush automatically. Once you get up or move around, the sensors think you're done, and then they blast away. If you stand and wipe, good game. This things that be making noise all day long. Number eight. Bald face. In another video on things too woke for this era, I talked about how it was once cool to have no hair on your face at all. I can't grow any facial hair, so this is this reaches out to me. This is good. I like this. I like punching in on this fact. Well, Queen Elizabeth I was the first to bring this idea into Western culture. She influenced women to completely pluck their eyebrows, and on top of that, they would also shave their hairline back as far as they could, so their faces would be as large and as big and bright as possible. Just right there, like the big moon. Just. It was common for women to soak bandages in a mix of ammonia, vinegar, walnut oil, all to hopefully, hopefully suppress the hair growth on their forehead. Facial hair was removed, but body hair, that was left untouched. The Catholic Church also influenced the look. Growing your hair out was a feminine display until you went out in public and had long hair. Then it was immodest. Because, of course. Number seven, loincloths. Okay, I have to adjust the jeans for this one. Going back to ancient Roman and ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Neat. Either that or you would just be naked. So, you know, if you're a nudist, great. Hit the thumbs up if you're a nudist. I don't know. I don't know why I said that. We're gonna keep going. I found this neat step-by-step -step on the internet how to make your own loincloth. And it's a bit more complicated than throwing on sweatshorts and calling it a day. We don't have a lot of archeological evidence today because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather also to make underwear, which is, just imagine that, I'm like, ha, ah, it's hot. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but we'll save that talk for another time. Number six, breast bags. There's a neat term, breast bags. Let's bring that one back, see if it sticks. Now, contrary to what I just explained over at point number seven, women, more often than not, didn't wear undergarments in the Middle Ages up here at least. But in 2008 at Austria's Langburn Castle, something that resembled a modern day bra was discovered. It's believed that only higher ups, ladies of nobility rather, were the only ones who had the privilege to wear these breast bags or breast cups. I say breast bags, sounds a little funnier. We have bags of milk in Canada, so you know, I'm connecting the, yeah, that's, that's, I gotta connect the jokes. I can't say much personally, but this does not look supportive enough at all. It's like a pirate flag, it's like ripped apart, this is nothing. If you have back problems, I don't think these breast bags are gonna help you. If you're ever catching up on some 13th century readings, well, now you have an image when you see the word breast bag. This, this eye patch that they called support. Number five, steam baths. Now looking back and learning that the Aztecs had public washrooms everywhere and had access to steam baths because of their irrigation is fantastic. I mean, come on, just think about it. You could relax after a long day in your own steam bath that's made by natural running water. It sounds like doing yoga there would make me feel more in touch with my inner chakras. And my mood crystals would glow just a little bit brighter. Imagine, you walk into a bathhouse after a long day, and then you see me just sitting there with a towel that barely fits. Well, hey there, good looking. Why don't you come on in and pop a squat next to me? I promise I don't hog all the steam. <laughs> I know it sounds like an amazing time, right? The more we talk about the Aztecs, the more they sound like a perfect society. I wonder what happened to them. I'm sure it was nothing bad. They gotta be out there somewhere. Move over, fellas, I'm coming in for the steam. The steam was thought to have healing properties and was connected to their spirituality. Women even gave birth in the steam rooms, which feels like a really sweaty time. I just, I don't know about that. There's a lot of sweat. Number four, Bath and Body Works. It's clear the Aztecs were just cleaner than the other civilizations of the past, and honestly, I'm here for it. There's only so much a guy can say about people being stinky in the past. I mean, really, the smell must have been horrible, especially down in the nether regions. My lady, I would like to have a child with you, but the fragrance that is coming from both of our undercarriages makes me want to get into my carriage and drive it into the nearest body of water. Yes. Aztecs were making soap like it was their day job, using various herbs and plants to create much nicer smells and perfumes. However, during the rainy months, Aztecs wouldn't wash or wash their clothes in penance. But I guess one month isn't so bad. Strangely enough, women wouldn't wash their faces when men went off to war. 
I'm not sure about that one, but hey, I'll take it. Gold star for staying clean, Aztecs. Gold star. Number three, Bath and Body Works Part Two. Okay, another scenario. You're in the sixth grade. You're sitting at a desk and listening to Mrs. Smith, and she's going over what today's art assignment is. As you begin to reach for your favorite shade of red crayon, an odor hits your nose. It's unlike anything you've ever smelled before, and it's coming from your armpit. Puberty-induced body odor. Not to worry. Your buddy has a can of the finest spray deodorant there is. He hands you a black can that says Axe. You are now one of them. And you start showing up to school dances with a seafoam pink button-up shirt with the collar popped and a Justin Bieber haircut with a hat on backwards. Yeah, that's right. All while drenched in a can of Axe's finest. Shark tooth necklace shows every girl in the room that you're a tough guy. God, those guys are the worst. Okay, no, the Aztecs didn't go that far, but they were aware of the horrors of the classroom BO and recommended a special bath prepared with lovely smelling aromas, which makes sense. Good smells go in, bad smells from your bum, they go out. However, there's two ingredients that make me question things. Apparently, no odor killing bath is complete without a fresh bone from a dog and a human. I'm just gonna leave that with you and think about how you'd feel with two bones floating in your bath. That's disgusting. Apparently, they had to be fresh, too. That's gross. Number two, the Aztec classic. I'm glad the Aztecs had better hygiene, because for once, I don't get super queasy talking about the things people did. However, it wouldn't be a video about Aztecs if I didn't talk about their favorite pastime. Sacrifice. And honey, if they were given out gold medals for it, the Aztecs would be record breakers. Sure, they weren't the only civilization to sacrifice people, but they did it with such theatrics. It would make my old theater teacher very proud. But unlike most civilizations, the Aztecs did this all the time. Whenever the calendar called for one, it was time for one. And if they ran out of people, they would go grocery shopping for more. Or actually just go to war and take people, which is not good. Just know that when a chief or a religious leader cuts the heart out of a man whilst alive for the entire city to see, he most likely had a clean cloth and water to wash his hands, making modern surgeons proud everywhere. Number one, the European bug. It's safe to say that Aztecs, while not as clean as people today, they were striving for better hygiene, more than any other civilization at the time, really. However, no amount of hand washing, sacrificing, or putting herbs in your bath can prepare them for the Spanish. Not just the swords and the guns and invading and such, no, I mean the sickness that Europeans brought with them. It's a plot similar to War of the Worlds, except the invaders brought all the nasties with them. No matter what the Aztecs did, it wasn't going to stop the waves of lovely things the Europeans brought over. Armpits are clean, but now they got black lungs. There's too many diseases to even name, there's a lot. Kicking off the list at number 10, Dirty Beds. Okay, so far on this disgusting series, I can't believe we're on part seven, but we've talked about storing chamber pots under your bed. Pretty yuck, that's if you were lucky enough to have a bed, of course. If you were rich in the 1400s, having a bedroom was the talk of the town. You would have guests over to hang out in your bedroom. That was like the place to be. Social gatherings in your bedroom, that's my worst nightmare. A couple of nights talking about noble deeds, meanwhile you're all tucked in with your ass out, hair all messy, half asleep, like, huh, who is it? Most of the time in the 14th century, your mattress wasn't even a mattress, it was just a pile of straw. It was horrible, you had to sleep in your clothes, the same tunic and cloak you've worn all day, remind you, because you'll freeze at night otherwise, right? Because you're basically outside, these barns, this old wooden, not great. Also, these beds weren't in your rooms or anything, they were just like tucked in a corner. You didn't have social gatherings around the sack of straw, you know what I mean? Your bed was more often than not riddled with bird poop as well. You weren't alone in these cold rooms, you know, birds hiding up above. Also, spiders? I don't even want to know. I don't want to dive into that. Let's move on. Number nine, mouthwash. Ancient Romans would use urine as mouthwash. I believe we've mentioned that before on this, again, disgusting series. It's always a fun fact to bring up at a house party next time you're drinking some Mountain Dew. Just be like, oh, did you know? The ammonia in urine was thought to ideally wash away the yuck. You just gotta get past the whole urine part, I guess. Doctors hate this one trick. Mm. Nero would tax the trade of imported bottled urine. That's how popular it was at this point. Some poor soul with a clipboard would have to stand all day and just be like, yep. In the 12th century, St. Hildegard von Bingen would advise all to wash their mouth with cold water to remove bacteria. Yeah, if only it was that easy, okay? Just one quick sh and spit it out and then you're good? No. I wish it was that easy, pal. Tortoise blood was also used once as mouthwash, alongside goat milk and vinegar. Out of those three options, imagine not picking goat's milk. You're like, hmm, but what year is the tortoise blood? Number eight, bath beans. 
Not to be confused with bath bombs, bath beans we're talking about. Bath beans, beans in the bath. Bath beans were used thousands of years ago in ancient China. They were these bars, or beans rather, these chunks, still like beans. They're made of bean powder, herbs, and much like our bath bombs today, they also included some nice fragrances. Just have a little bit of a, mm. The pancreas of a pig was also commonly used, so it wasn't totally nice. Once the blood was drained, you'd mix it with the bean powder and the nice stuff. Now, originally, it began by using leftover water from cooking rice. Eventually, it became bath beans, which is, you know, AKA soap, old soap. Some bath beans were loaded with ingredients, much like the bath bombs we can find today, so they were all quite unique. You can make your own little bath bean. Number seven, purple nut sedge weed. Archaeology is fascinating. And no, I'm not just talking about dinosaur stuff. They look at rocks and be like, ah yes, a Viking was here thousands of years ago and he was a Libra. How do you know that? This is so impressive. Ancient sites tell a story. And Karen Hardy, an archeologist with the Catalan Institute for Research and Advanced Studies at the University of Barcelona, she found another ancient hygiene practice while studying a prehistoric site in Sedan. Plaque, it turns out, can last thousands of years. It calcifies once it mixes with food, then after it's stored below the gums, game over, it's there for good. Specifically, thousands of years ago, it's, it was there to stay. We couldn't really get that out. Hardy was studying remains that were two to 9,000 years old, and in their teeth, they found traces of pollen, dirt, and plant fibers. More specifically, they found evidence of a plant called purple nutsedge. It contained lysine, which is an amino acid that we need to live, so although it didn't taste the best, it sure was vital. Ancient Egyptians used the root for perfume, but this new study shows that purple nutsedge may have been used to prevent tooth decay. They would just chew on roots all day to take care of their teeth. The plant produces antibacterial chemicals, so chewing on them would have been beneficial. Little different than the inside of a tortoise, I'd say. It's definitely a step in the right direction. Number six, smoking. Back in 1665, during a plague in London, you were told to smoke cigarettes because they were considered disinfectants. Sore throat, and smoke this pack of cigarettes. I'm sure that'll help. Help you cough a bit more, if anything. We mentioned before tobacco smoke enemas in like part one or two or three or something over there. But this is just bad advice. Since mouth to mouth wasn't a thing in the 50s, if you were trying to save a drowning victim, you would also have to blow smoke in their face or their butts. Either way, how insane is that? Can you imagine that actually playing out in real time? He's not breathing, quick. Hang on. Cut to 1964, turns out smoking is bad for us. Who knew? Cigarettes were labeled as deadly going forward after that point. It's pretty intense now though, eh? The photos on cigarette packages now, they're haunting to look at. I still think teenagers smoking to stay in shape is a bit scarier to be honest than that image. She's always like, <sighs> her face is just like pulled, so scary. Don't smoke. Number five, national flower. While flower was sometimes, sometimes permitted, flower wasn't encouraged and was one time banned for household use. It was still being allowed commercially for like other cakes and biscuits and stuff. But they had to supply a replacement, so wartime specific products were launched. One was called the national flower, wheat meal essentially. It was gray in color and had a lot of bran in it. It wasn't as smooth or as soft as flour, so women would desperately like sieve it through their stockings to kind of get like a nice like desired soft texture. Didn't always work. They also used this as a way to feed their chickens without having to spend money on rations. This flour was the key ingredient as to what would be called the national loaf. Nutritionists, funny enough, loved it for some reason because it was like really high in fiber and tried to fight for the bread to be popular post-war. But unfortunately, it wasn't very tasty. It sucked. It was often referred to as Hitler's secret weapon because everyone hated it so much. On the upside though, the government was able to keep the supply plentiful enough, so bread was never rationed. Number four, spam. Oh, spam. The canned meat people still seem to love. The British tradition for mealtime was to have at least one meat and two veg. You can guess what stood in for the meat. Spam. The government tried to introduce the Brits to corned beef, an insult. So then they tried something called snowick, which was like a snake mackerel from South Africa. People didn't even like to talk about that one. But then spam came over from the US. It was filling and tasty, just enough to fill that little spot in their tummy. Although it couldn't replace a good steak, it had a long shelf life, and it was perfect for troops in the trenches. Number three, pig and chicken clubs. One of the things I love about England or the UK in general is that everyone, even in suburban neighborhoods, have chickens in their backyard. Okay, maybe not everyone, but it's really, really popular and it's kind of normal. My aunt has always kept them in her backyard since as far back as I can remember. But it wasn't always like that. 
In the 1940s, commercially farmed hens had to be sold off as food because they didn't have enough to feed them. This led to a massive egg shortage. Only one egg was allowed per person per week. Unless you were expecting mother, you were allowed two. But as a result, people who hadn't kept chickens before this started to in their backyards. You had to give up your egg ration, but got to have more grain rations instead. The same thing happened with pigs. Neighborhoods would keep pigs, feed them together, and then share in them. Some would even keep their pigs private, but they had to be registered so you could give up your meat coupons, but some never did. So a little bit cheeky. Number two, Roosevelt coffee. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. Some days I really couldn't do this job without coffee. Like I, I really couldn't, it's a problem. And I'm sure many people feel the same, but sadly for them, back then, coffee was rationed. Pretty much every ounce of coffee was shipped overseas, making coffee impossible to come by in the States. Americans were tasked with drinking less than one cup a day. That's like compared to everyone else's four cups a day. Introducing Roosevelt coffee. People started making it to help fill in the gap. It was simply reused coffee grounds mixed with ingredients like chicory and posthum. It made a kind of watery version of a cup of joe. The chicory added a little spice to it while posthum, a molasses-like substance, added color and flavor, I guess? It wasn't a good time. But last but not least, Hershey's chocolate. The men who took up arms in the trenches faced some of the worst horrors ever imagined. To them, any day, any moment could be their last. A pretty bleak world to live in day in and day out. Morale was crucial to maintain as it could mean the difference between life and death for many soldiers. One way to help support them was food. On June 6, 1944, the Allies stormed the beaches of Normandy during the D-Day invasion. But what you may not know is that an unlikely treat fueled them throughout the mission. Hershey's chocolate bars. Hershey's was approached by the US Army in 1937, way long before the war started, about creating a bar for emergency rations. They had to weigh four ounces, be high in energy, withstand high temperatures, and taste a little better than a boiled potato. They didn't want it to be too tasty, otherwise they'd run out. It was called the D-Ration Bar, a blend of chocolate, sugar, cocoa butter, skim milk, and oat flour. And it ended up not tasting too great, but it gave the Allies enough oomph to seize the day. Number 10, Snake Eyes. Well, not exactly snake eyes, but after extended use of belladonna drops and eyes, you would probably wish that a snake bit you in the eyes. Belladonna is poisonous. It's a no calzone, red flag but yet it was still used by Egyptian royalty. Basically, the drops of poison would dilate your pupils, and that would be considered to be beautiful for some reason, I guess, okay. Extended use of the drops had terrible side effects for the user, blindness being one of them. You gotta remember, folks in this time have no social security, and the best doctors can do for you is tell you to go take a bath in crocodile dung and to pray to the gods for more, I guess. Sure, okay. So to avoid that tragedy, go for the natural look and avoid the eye drops. You'll thank me later. Number nine, more eye stuff. Thought I was done with the eye stuff? Ah, well, guess again, amigo. I ain't done yet. I've got lots more to say about that. Okay, maybe a little. Eyeshadow and eye color. Some ladies today would say no special outfit is complete without it. And honestly, I have to agree, ladies. Sometimes y'all do some stuff with your eyes that makes me say, damn, you look good. Damn, you look good. However, some ladies might be cautious to slap some color on their face if they knew the origins of the product. As for the royalty of Egypt, eye makeup was in. It seemed to be a trend. However, they weren't so cautious of where their makeup got its origins. Egyptian eye glitter had two key ingredients, applicable powder and bugs. Yeah, you know the super colorful ones that are like really big and you wouldn't want to be around? Yeah, those, beetles, scarabs, and pretty much anything you can find. They would then crush them into a heavenly pulp and smear it all over their royal faces. I have issues with spiders and wasps, as it is. I have no interest in wearing them whatsoever. I actually hate wasps. That's just, you mean just crushing up a bunch of, and just, oh, this is good. Oh, I love this. This is the best. Yeah, no, don't do that. Number eight, sweet traps. When you're royalty of one of the most successful empires and civilizations in human history, it means you ain't gonna lift a finger. Less than any other celebrities do today, probably. So what to do with all that extra time in your hands instead of living like everyone else? Well, how about a picnic? That sounds nice, actually. Sounds great, right? Except when we bring out all of our favorite treats. The flies and bugs bother us, and we can't look beautiful if we're covered in bugs head to toe. How did the Egyptians fix this, you ask? Well, it's simple. Don't let the bugs bite you in the first place. Basically, you get one of your forced volunteers, maybe a couple actually, and you slather the poor devils in honey. 
till they looked like your favorite pastry from Tim Hortons. Play said glazed serving away from the picnic, and now you can enjoy it in sunshine and peace. The screaming of being eaten alive by bugs might dampen the mood, so just just wear earplugs. It's fine. Just you stay over there and just get eaten. It's fine. No problem. No problem. Number seven, unhooded Sith. Circumcision is important in a lot of cultures of yesterday and today. Now at this channel, my job is to come out here every week and make you laugh. So to the men out there who still have their Jedi robes, imagine every day of your life you got sand in places that sand shouldn't be. Anakin Skywalker's worst nightmare and honestly explains why he hates sand so much. But perhaps one of the reasons Egyptians used this hygiene service was to stop sand getting in their wiener's one-eyed bandit. There's no showers, nothing to really get it out once it's in there. That's no good. I guess you could take a dip in the Nile River, but uh, there's too many crocodiles in there, and who has the time to jump in the Nile River when they're busy being forced to build large structures that will stand the test of time? So you better line up, fellas, or be cursed to feel like Anakin Skywalker for the rest of your life. The prequel one, too, not the, not the cool animated one, the one that whines a lot. That one. You don't want to be that one. Number six, nice dentist. Turns out not all Egyptian dentistry is completely awful. It turns out they may have come up with the first toothbrush. Other civilizations had examples of one too, so it's hard to tell exactly, but the Egyptians had one. But one thing they did have over everyone else were Tic Tacs, or breath mints, actually. Honestly, this makes a lot of sense. Imagine it was Valentine's Day. You just walked past a large pyramid. There's sand in places on your body where sand just shouldn't be. When you notice the smell of your breath, and it's something awful. But not to worry, because you purchased breath mints from the market. Yes, that's right. Now smooching with your Egyptian sweetheart can go on without a hitch. The mints were made from nice smelling herbs and mints, sometimes roasted over a fire to form little candies. An ancient Egyptian solution to an ancient Egyptian problem. I kinda like that one actually, kinda nice. Gonna put a mint in, it's kinda nice. Nice. Number five, bread and entertainment. Hygiene is health, and health is mental health. And that means after a long day, you need entertainment. That's why you came here, hopefully. They say that after bread comes entertainment. I feel the same. Where would my generation be if not for the ability to rewatch The Office infinitely? Aztecs have been theatrical killers, sure, but they also had a soft spot for the arts. During their crazy spring cleaning festival to save the world, you may just find the Aztecs enjoy music and poetry. Some of the poetry even survived the downfall of the Aztecs and is around today. I'd recite it, but I would need some help from Chris to help sound things out. I wonder if they had a poem for a stranger that comes from a faraway land to take all our golden riches away. Hmm. Number four, more than one way to skin a cat. Here I am talking about Aztecs, and that means I gotta talk about how bloodthirsty they were. Seriously, it's good they washed their hands because with the amount of blood on them, well, I don't have a joke for that, they just kinda got crazy with it. It's estimated that 20,000 people a year perish to sacrifice. That's that's way too many, dude, that's that's wrong. Which, if I'm being honest, those numbers probably could've helped you fight off the Spanish when they, they came to take everything. What do I know? Cutting the heart out of people while they were still alive, a lot of heads no longer attached to bodies, and something that's just so heinous. Texas Chainsaw fans rejoice, because the Aztecs loved a good skinning. Just a good old fashioned peel skin off them. Just take it off, George. George, take your skin off. I don't know why Jerry Seinfeld's skinning somebody, but sure. What do they do with the skins afterward? Do they throw them into the crowd and they cheer it on? Or, cause that's, that, that's just wrong, man. That's not right. That's wrong, bruv. The chief was so upset by this one that he had nothing to say, actually. Chief is speechless. He's got nothing. Number three, multiple wives. The act of doing the deed in the bedroom can be messy sometimes. It happens, a lot of passion. And keeping that area on your body and in your life clean is important. Or so says my sixth grade health teacher. I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. But you gotta think back in the day how sometimes keeping that area fresh it was difficult, especially because we have no self-control and we went a little crazy with it. Take for example that having multiple wives was a status symbol. And let me tell you something, they weren't sitting around waiting for the new season of Stranger Things. They were doing as they do on the Discovery Channel. Number two, get your money right. Any good accountant will tell you that treating your portfolio like good hygiene is a good idea. Go for multiple smells or invest in multiple things. Check out what's on the market. Might be a new perfume, maybe a new stock. And while you're at it, dump a huge investment into fart bucks. Okay, well maybe not that accountant, but believe it or not, the Aztecs were great accountants and had good records of pretty much everything, which is unusual because most cultures in Mesoamerica just just didn't. And with the amount of gold and riches that the Aztecs had accumulated over time, it was kind of necessary. So you can understand that when the Spanish showed up, 
They were salivating at the sight of all the treasure that did not belong to them because Hernan Cortez was going to take it. Hand it over, you nice smell of weirdos. Number one, why doubt dude? Through everything the Aztecs went through or did, it all came down to a fever uh, and a cough and many other symptoms, actually. All of their triumphs and losses, all their sacrifices, and all the times they tried to fend off the Spanish. Futile compared to their fight against the sicknesses that the Spanish had brought over. Once there was a patient zero, it was pretty much all over. As good as their roots and medical herbs were at healing, ain't nothing gonna cure that black lung. If it can do what it did to a big handsome cowboy, then it can do the same to everyday people. <laughs> Dutch, <laughs> we got the Aztec sick again, Dutch. <laughs> I got some chocolate though. Hope you like corn in your chocolate, Dutch. <laughs> Kicking off the list at number 10, Koremlu. It's the 1930s, you're looking for a way to get rid of those upper lip hairs. Well, Karemlu promises to have your back. They actually promise to have your armpits as well. Yeah, armpit hair and upper lip hair, gone. For good, you say? Wow, that sounds absolutely lovely. Just don't read the fine print, don't flip it and zoom in. Don't zoom in. This cream was applied to the upper lip, but side effects caused hair loss all over your body. And sometimes users would suffer from paralysis. It was on the market for $10, which back in the 1930s, that's a lot, a lot, a lot. Like for hair removal cream, that's a lot, a lot. Those are like Beats headphones, what is this? The Journal of the American Medical Association called this product out as viciously dangerous. Rightfully so, and those who suffered from those harsh side effects collectively sued the company into bankruptcy come 1932. The silent killer here in the cream was thallium, commonly used as rat poison. That ought to do it. Number nine, ancient birth control. Although birth control today is easier than in ancient times, it's still a chore. It's routine, it's something you have to keep track of daily, and things go wrong if you don't and lose track. There's a plethora of side effects. You have to take fake ones just so your body what? Your hormones are all over the place. You can get cancer from these, you can get blood clots potentially. There's really, there's very little research on long-term effects for birth control pills. And also I'm speaking not from experience. There's no birth control pill for guys. This is wildly unfair. I have the most respect. These pills mess you up. My friends will tell me their side effects and I can't believe it. You're all troopers. Ancient Egyptians, their method of ancient birth control was by mixing acacia fruit with honey and ground dates. This paste would then be used directly, and believe it or not, it was rather effective. Acacia gum ferments and then turns into lactic acid, which can prevent pregnancy. Not all of these ancient methods worked like this. There's another that's really bizarre, and I'll save that for the end. It's absolutely insane, I can't believe it. We'll ease our way there, you know, we'll, we'll start nice. Number eight, Lash Lure. Turning the calendars back to 1933, the year FM radios and drive-in movie theaters were introduced and as well as the horrifying and deadly mascara, Lash Lure. This 1930s cosmetic contained a chemical, P-phenylidamine. That's how you know it's bad, when you can't even pronounce the thing. This mascara left blisters all over your face, your eyelids, the whole thing, it was really bad. There was eventually a death in 1933. One woman sadly developed an infection, a bacterial infection, and then passed away. It was so bad that later that year, her before and after photos were used in an FDA display titled The Chamber of Horrors. It was a horrible incident, but a good way to get the attention from higher ups, so something like this never happens again. Lash Lure was then the first product in history that was removed from stores entirely, so it worked. We're in the middle of something kind of similar now, I think. Cigarette packages have those horrible side effects to smoking right there on the packaging. The girl with the face. Could we see the day smoking is outlawed? I don't know, I feel like we're close. It's caused quite a few more deaths than Lash Lure, that's all I'm saying. Number seven, bad toothpaste. Doramad toothpaste was advertised in the 1920s. The ad shows a blonde lady with a lovely smile. Some would even say glowing. Right below reads Doramad radioactive toothpaste. Radioactive toothpaste, I've uh, hmm, that sounds bad. I've played enough Fallout to know that radioactive toothpaste probably isn't a great product, especially to put in and around your mouth. It even loudly advertises its radioactive ingredients. Can you imagine this? Increase the defense of teeth and gums. The cells are loaded with new life energy. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. That last one I made up, but you can't tell, right? How insane is this? This secret ingredient to shinier smiles and brighter futures was thorium. The god of thunder does not brush with thorium. He uses it to polish his hammer. Yeah, it's very toxic. Number six, Gorad's cream. Once advertised as a magic beautifier, doesn't that sound like a neat time? 
Gorad's Oriental Cream hit the market back in 1936. This cream was supposed to freshen up your skin, make you look lighter, younger, whatever Paul Rudd's doing, whatever his secret is, we're still trying to figure that one out. That sort of thing. But instead, this skin cream had one user ending up in a book that's very Chamber of Horrors style. This magic ingredient that was meant to magically make you beautiful had some magic mercury in it. Not something you want on your face, yeah, at all. The results were haunting. This woman had soon developed black gums, her teeth loosened, and dark rings appeared around her eyes and even her neck. Mercury poisoning is not fun. Number five, moss. We're halfway through and I'll say it again. I'll remind you all again, I have the utmost respect for you ladies. As a guy doing this list and like writing this list, I mean the things you had to craft back then and then, you know, put, uh, oh my lord. For example, going back to the 10th century, this was a time long before Tampax was ever even a thing. Women were forced to get creative when it came to personal hygiene. They had to just figure it out themselves and literally collect grass or moss, sheepskin lined with cotton. It was mostly moss all the time. You all are absolute troopers. If it wasn't moss, other solutions were small pieces of wood with lint wrapped around it. Number four. Q-tips. If you haven't heard, Q-tips are not for your ears. Yeah, I thought this was a rumor. Turns out we're all lawbreakers. I use two at the same time if I'm in a rush. No, flip them. I'm a vigilante when it comes to Q-tips. Q-tips were invented in 1923 by Leo Gertzenzang, right after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Kinda sounds like his wife invented Q-tips, but okay, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-Tip Baby Gays, and then finally, just Q-Tips. It's like a Sweet Baby Rays, that barbecue sauce. Oh, so good. They just called it Sweet Rays. Maybe they gave it up the baby, I don't know. You have to try and work it out. I don't know what the bit is, but I'm like, hey, that's a great sauce, and I just thought of that sauce. Baby Rays, Baby Gays. Back in those days, Q-Tips were dipped in boric acid, and they were intended to sterilize wounds. Yeah, we're just out here like, my eyes roll back every time. I get so, I get way too deep. I get too deep where I'm like, oh, it's gone. Huh, there it is, magic, I'm a magician. After this, there were even Q soaps, Q oils, Q creams. It's like Apple, like I, iPad, iPhone, the other eye stuff. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be in your ears? What's that about? Well, in 2008, Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax into your ear canal, leading to possible infections more than anything. When Cheesebro Ponds bought the company back in 1962, they added a warning on the box, a warning that we and I gladly still ignore. Just talking about this, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go clean my stuff out. Mm. I have Q-tips in my bag, literally, I'm always prepared. Always strapped. Number three, hair removal trick. In the late 19th century, something called thallium actate started to sweep the nation. It was a hair removal method, which even today is the talk of the town. Laser off that peach fuzz for good. Zero, gone. Thallium was used back in the day, but originally thallium was prescribed for those who suffered with ringworm. But even so, thallium didn't do anything per se about the ringworm, it just caused the patient's hair to fall off. So the ringworm was then easier to find. I'd prefer a haircut if you ask me, but sure. Thallium does the trick as well. Eventually, thallium was sold as a cream, a toxic cream. It should never touch your skin at all, and it's a face cream. Are you kidding? This thing was once rat poison as well, and now we're rubbing it around like it's Bath and Body Works Noel cream. It's my favorite cream, the green one. Oh God, gone in two days. This was outlawed, thankfully, in the 30s, but it had to get bad pretty first. Number two, Aqua Tofana. Going back to the 1600s for this one. Also, if you're a murderino, you'll enjoy this bit of dark history. Aqua Tofana was a cosmetic that was sold to women in the early 1630s. It was a cosmetic that doubled as a poison. Yeah, <laughs> sneaky, right? Some Assassin's Creed shit going on here. The origins of this deadly cosmetic that was sold and responsible for around like 600 deaths is pretty wild. So back in 1632, two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofana Diamato, they both created this poison. They worked together and created it so that when their husbands kissed them, on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. But eventually, Tiofana was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through her daughter, Yulia Tiofana. She took this deadly recipe to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. And finally, coming in at number one, more ancient birth control. 
Okay, we kicked this list off catching up with ancient Egyptians and the uh, aid of acacia trees and all that jazz. So I figured we'd end on a ridiculous birth control method from the ancient Roman days. Seranus, who was known as a Greek gynecologist back then, his idea for Planned Parenthood was not a good one. It was not a good idea. He wrote that after you, you know, bump uglies, in order to prevent pregnancy, the woman must squat and sneeze. First of all, no, not a chance, no, no. And also, if you're thinking about it, no. Secondly, who can sneeze on demand? I certainly can't. I had a really nice time tonight, cheers. <clears throat> that's, not, that's not possible, no. Many methods from the past are questionable. In ancient China, it was commonly told that drinking hot mercury could prevent pregnancy. Yeah, leave mercury away from your body, that will literally kill you. Ancient Greeks would drink blacksmith water because they too thought the exposure to lead could prevent getting pregnant. This idea came back around World War I as well. Women were working in factories and actually trying to get exposed to lead. That was the whole idea. Bad. These are pretty dark, so I'll leave you on this one. In the Dark Ages, European women wore amulets made of weasel testicles to magically ward off pregnancies. Poor weasels. Black magic is the worst, isn't it? Number 10, rationing. So I think it's important to begin this list by talking about rationing. Lots of food was sent away to help the soldiers going off to fight in the war. That means that each person only had a certain amount of coupons that they were allowed to use to buy things like eggs, sugar, flour, etc. There were less shipments coming from other companies due to the threat of U-boat attacks. So food became really expensive and people panicked, rushing to stores to stock up. In 1918, the government decided to introduce rationing so as to develop a way to share food fairly. That way grocery stores didn't face a ridiculous shortage of toilet paper. Hmm. Even the king and queen of England had ration cards, and the cards could only be used at certain shops. If you were caught stealing or cheating, then you could be fined or even thrown into prison. Fortunately, nobody starved, but people were often left hungrier than usual. To aid with that missing spot in their tummy, people began cultivating their own gardens, and preserved jams, pickles, and chutneys became really, really popular. Number nine. Vegetarian chopped liver. So with rations and war being introduced, people had to get used to a whole different way of life. If they were craving one of their favorites for dinner, they had to get inventive. Hence, vegetarian chopped liver. It won't surprise you to learn that during World War II, a lot of Jewish families in occupied territories were advised to stretch their food rations very thin, which often meant filling in a recipe with something a lot cheaper. Chopped liver was a staple dish, so to find a way to fill the gap, they created a vegetarian version. They found a way to make it kind of using fresh fruits and vegetables meat was swapped out for green beans peas onions hard-boiled eggs if possible and crackers number eight mock goose so the war is on rations are in play but Christmas is still coming and hey guys it's Thanksgiving this weekend too happy Thanksgiving Americans what on earth was going to take the place of a delicious roast Christmas goose well I introduced to you mock goose I'm just realizing that World War eras were actually pretty vegetarian friendly because no one could really afford meat. Mock goose was a combination of sliced potatoes, apples, cheese, sage, vegetable stock, and a teaspoon of flour. They would place a layer of sliced potatoes, then apples, sage, seasoning, cheese, and then repeat. Basically a potato, apple, and cheese lasagna. I'm glad they didn't try to make it look like a goose because it's almost worse eating something that doesn't taste what it looks like, you know? Number seven, war cake. Though the recipe was printed in the Second World War, it also made the rounds in World War I. People weren't going to stop craving delicious tea cakes and sweets just because of the war. If anything, it made them crave it more. But they had to make do with what they had. Recipes like this one often appeared in women's magazines as food conservation was seen as a way women contributed to the war effort. Canadian war cake goes as follows. And though the ingredients don't seem that odd, the making was a bit strange. It includes two cups of sugar, two cups of hot water, three tablespoons of lard or a fat, one teaspoon of salt, cloves, cinnamon, seedless raisins, not a raisin fan. This would then all be boiled together and then cooled. They would boil that together. I've never actually read a recipe like that at all. Then four cups of flour would be added and a tablespoon of soda and baking powder. The consistency of the cake was closer to that of a dense bread, but when you've got to take it day by day, it was a small joy. 
Number six, the potato pasty. Potatoes, I love potatoes. Easy to grow, versatile, tasty. Potatoes became the go-to saviors of many a recipe. The British government even handed out leaflets encouraging people to get inventive with the potato. There were recipes from the normal baked potatoes, biscuits, and even something called a potato piglet, which was supposed to substitute somehow a sausage roll. But then of course, there was the potato pasty. It was a pie pastry which contained margarine or a fat, fat was also really hard to come by, flour, potato, and salt. They had to eat it as soon as it was hot as it had a tendency to dry up once it cooled down. They also used potatoes in general with other recipes to make them more filling. Number five, lice. Yes, while we're talking about hair care, why not touch on the subject of lice? It's a problem everywhere, not just in your elementary school. Ancient China had lice problems just like ancient Egypt did. While almost everyone chose the path of baldness in Egypt, it was not so in China. No, other than honey locusts and rice water to clean your hair, one of the common practices to deal with lice was to, um, well, it was to eat the lice that you picked out of your hair. Hey, grub is grub, but I think, uh, I think I'd like to move on from this topic now. Let's, let's go, let's go, let's get the heck out. Number four, poo poo stick. I'm sorry that we have to talk about this, but actually, you know what, I'm not that sorry. Just as it does now, going to drop the kids off at the pool in ancient China left you with the task of cleaning yourself up afterwards. Wiping your bottom, that's what I'm talking about. Now, they did have paper back in ancient China like we talked about in our ancient Chinese inventions video, but paper was expensive and the only ones who really used it were the emperor and royalty like him who would use straw paper. Before that, and for everyone else, people would use a stick-like tool called a Chugi, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Which was basically bamboo strips that were shaped to be thin and flat and slightly wide with rounded edges. Some of these even had great water absorption and a lovely scent. Those who were a bit more fortunate would then wash with water, kind of like an ancient bidet, and then use some good smelling stuff to make it all better. Other than that, a lot of people were cool with using leaves or sticks and stones and honestly, whatever could do the trick really. I mean, when you gotta go, you gotta go. Number three. Using dirt to clean? Okay, okay, not dirt, but soil. Ancient cultures, including the ancient Chinese, would use soil as a tool in cleaning, which actually had the benefit of being able to help remove oil stains. Now, how did this happen? Apparently, it is believed to be caused by the alkaline qualities of the soil that really helps with the removal of oil. Soil and oil, I did not like that. Which the Chinese actually seemed to figure out how to specifically utilize. The Chinese used a kind of natural alkali to clean their clothes, which evolved to be scented to help keep the clothes nice and funky smelling. The use of this stuff was so popular that there were tons of scented alkali stores that opened up around China, with some even becoming pretty famous. Maybe not unusual, but definitely very interesting and a precursor to modern laundry soaps. So, hmm. Number two, water purification. While this may be considered more of a health thing than a hygiene thing, I mean, I'd argue that hygiene is health, so get at me. <laughs> the ancient Chinese discovered and made extensive use of groundwater for drinking, and they kept record of how they would keep their wells and well water nice and clean. The construction of the wells was pretty important, with the bottom of the wells regularly being dredged to keep the water clean. The inner walls of the wells were reinforced with ceramic bricks and tiles to stop that pesky soil and other impurities from falling into the water, and the openings of the wells were covered to safeguard against contamination from above the ground. The cleaning of wells was even institutionalized as a feast in some places. So cleaner water and food, it's a win-win. Knowing early on that drinking water could make them pretty sick, the Chinese boiled their water and allowed the sediment to settle before using it for cooking and drinking. They also knew what was up with water. They just knew what was up in general. It's pretty great. Okay, let's move on. I'm talking too much. Number one, no stink. Smelling funky fresh and clean was all the rage, as it should be today too. I ain't trying to be on the subway with a nose full of body odor, just as I wouldn't wish to submit anyone else to that. To be fair, not everyone knows they stanky and some people don't get a choice, but back in ancient China, those who were wealthy enough would spice up their weekly baths with roots, flowers, peppers, ginger, and all that yummy smelling goodness to basically create a lovely smelling cleansing soup to plop themselves into. Women would also carry around aromatic pouches that would just keep a nice smell around them at all times. Those who were not as wealthy would have to find other means to keep things fresh though. One that I'm not too sure would actually help smell-wise was applying their own pee-pee 
to their pits once a year on New Year's. This was done as a kind of a disinfectant. But like I said, I'm, I'm not too sure about this one, but if anyone has the knowledge, uh, firsthand or otherwise, keep it to yourself, uh, let me know, like down in the comments. I'm, I'm genuinely curious.